consent agenda, we have the minutes of meetings, January 12, 2015. Um, several reappointments. Um, first to the Board of Health, uh, Marie Walsh Condon, um, the Commission on Arts and Culture, Stephanie Marlin Curiel, uh, Conservation Commission, David White, Constable Roland Amaras Jr., Disability Commission, John Thompson, Board of Library Trustees, Barbara Muldoon, Vision 2020, Gordon Jameson. We have a request for a one-day beer and wine license for 2815 at the Regent Theater for Sigmund, Sen Sigmund Says. And we have a request for three all-day, or one-day all-alcohol license at Arlington Catholic High School. Uh, first for March 7th, the second for March 21st, and the third for March 8th. Is anyone here to speak on any of these agenda items? Seeing none, uh, do we have a motion? Move approval. Do we have a second? second. Is there uh, somebody? Looks like we have, yeah, please come to the microphone. Hi, sorry to get that in time. Uh, oh. My name's Jeff Temperi. I think I was on the ACC board appointment. I was supposed to be on oh. the agenda. We haven't got there yet. Oh, okay. But we'll get back, back to you shortly. Yeah. These are reappointments. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate your excitement. <laughs> um, so we have a uh, motion. Do we have a second? I second. Yeah, believe we did. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Said. Moving on, public hearings. Uh, CDBG uh, performance update from program year 2014-2015. Uh, Kath. Good evening, I'm Laura Wiener, Assistant Director of Planning, um, here for Carol Kowalski, Director of Planning, who had a conflict with another <coughs> meeting tonight. And with me also is Anna Witten, our Grants Administrator, who runs the CDBG program. Um, <clears throat> the Community Development Block Grant Entitlement Program provides federal funds annually to urban communities for decent housing and ex to expand economic opportunities for low principally for low and moderate income people. 70% of the grant needs to go to benefit low and moderate income persons. This is the 41st year that Arlington has received funds under this program. Each activity must meet one of the following national objectives. Benefit low and moderate income persons, prevent or eliminate slums or blight, or address urgent community development needs that pose a serious and immediate threat to the health and welfare of the community. This year is also the start of the five-year planning cycle. HUD requires us to do a five-year plan as well as a one-year plan. We had um, a meeting for some of the service providers in town um, in December that was extremely well attended. Joe Kira was there. And um, we talked about, we, try, we asked the service providers to try to project out their needs for the coming five-year period. This year we received 29 applications with uh, a requested amount of $1,845,000. Last year, we received $1,085,000 from HUD, so that's about $800,000 less than what has been requested. There were three new applicants this year. The department is pleased to submit the performance repor report of this past year as well as the request for the coming year. And both Anna and I are here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Laura. Do we have uh, questions from the board? I'm seeing none. Uh, questions from the audience? Seeing none. Um, moving on. Yo. So I, I guess um, I, just for the sake of uh, other people who may not know what our process is, so what's going to happen with the current proposals that we've now just received, that we're actually, I'm going to move receipt of the media report and move receipt of the applications, if that's appropriate. Well, maybe should or, we wait till uh, oh, the next just, agenda? Too much oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. All right. Move receipt for the of the performance update. Second. We have a motion to second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Set. Um, so, so now, I'm yes. looking at the funding proposal for this year, or the funding request for this year. So uh, we have a selectman subcommittee, which consists of uh, Stephen and myself, and Anna, and Carol, and Adam. Um, and we will meet 
Um, and we typically, we typically meet two or three times, first to make a broad cut and to decide what additional information we need that we don't have, and then we come back and reconvene and kind of make a, a further tightening of what we suggest. Then we'll bring that recommendation to this full board, and the full board will vote the approval, which we then share with town meeting and ask for their blessing, though it's technically our vote that actually does it. Is that, did I miss anything? No, that sounds about okay. right. Um, I, I will just add that um, it comes with very difficult choices. Um, all of the applicants are incredibly deserving, um, and we wish we could give them more. Um, but we do the best that we can to allocate it fairly and evenly, and uh, I'm sure we'll continue to uh, do so uh, in the coming years. Um, further discussion from the board? Seeing none. Um, questions from the audience? Comments? Seeing none. Um, so move. I move receipt of the applications. And I second that. Do we have a motion and a second? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Now, I would, um, with, I believe I do see some faces, uh, familiar faces, um, if they would like to talk about their, uh, give a brief overview of their application, um, I invite you to come uh, to the microphone now. Perhaps we'll um, just line up behind the microphone and if you want to give a brief, uh, brief introduction and um, talk about the value of your program, uh, that would be great. Hi, Mrs. Regan. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Peggy Regan, and I am co-founder with my colleague and friend Janet McGuire of Operation Success Learning Center, which is housed in the Allington Projects. Um, we appreciate being considered for the grant, and just so for the record, um, all the money we get goes directly to servicing the children. We've been in operation for 15 years. We run four nights a week, nine months a year, and we've been doing it for 15 years, all volunteers. We have no salaries. So that being said, I would like to introduce one of our volunteers. We mostly have teachers from Audison Middle School who are amazing. They work all day and they come down and help us at night. And we do have some really um, wonderful people from the town. And one of them is Chris Doyle, and I'd like to introduce him and he'll explain a little bit about more about what we do. Thanks. Thank you very much. Chris Doyle, One Richfield Road. Uh, thank you, Peggy. I just, I mean, Peggy's really said it all. Uh, basically, the uh, Operation Success is a learning center, and it's open to students of the middle school and high school who live in the uh, Monotony Manor uh, neighborhood. Uh, as she said, we're open uh, four days a week from 7 to 7.30, and uh, we use one of the apartments. We have try to chop it up in the best way we can. We have a computer room with uh, eight workstations, fully internet connected. Uh, we use every space available uh, in, that, in that apartment. Uh, we have roughly about 35 kids who avail of the service. On an average night, there could be anywhere from 18 to 20 kids. We have uh, volunteers. It's an all-volunteer staffed uh, place. We have about three or four volunteers who act as mentors on a regular basis, uh, helping with homework, with projects, with uh, you know whatever research they need to do. The majority of the, of the volunteers are all artisan middle school teachers, uh, some former teachers, and then we have members of the community who also help out. So we have a group of about maybe 20 volunteers who work on a rotating basis. The main focus of uh, Operation Success is academics, but we also try and encourage an all-round development. So we, we'll arrange a cultural trip, we'll go to the theater, we'll go to a sporting event, we will, uh, you know, we'll have a movie night. And, and we also try and focus on some issues that the kids face. For example, a couple of nights ago, we had a boys' night, which was attended by about 15 young students and a bunch of uh, mentors, and we talked about issues such as uh, domestic violence and uh, respect for women. So, you know, we try to, we try to give the kids a well-rounded, uh, it's a very safe place. It's, uh, you know, the kids enjoy it. They, uh, we encourage them to uh, take pride in what they're doing. So we have a bulletin board. They put up their report cards and their test results. 
and uh, you know that board is always overflowing. I, I just want to thank the board for all the support that you've given us over the years. We are asking this year for the same amount we asked for last year. It's, uh, I know it's, it's a tough choice that you have to make. Uh, the money goes strictly to the, uh, the program. It's uh, computer supplies, books, textbooks, reading materials for the summer, and things like that. So uh, once again, I thank you for, uh, for your support in the past, and I ask you to consider our request. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am Deanne DuPont. And I'm Julie Kremer. And we're co-founders and board members of Foodlink. And you're probably wondering why I have this box here with me. And uh, in the food rescue uh, arena, one of the uh, units of measure is a banana box. And uh, if you were looking at a van, uh, you'll ask, well, how many banana boxes does it carry? Or if we work with the like Thompson School or Arlington Boys and Girls Club, and we say, well, how many boxes of fruit do you need? They know we're talking about a banana box. So our operations, currently we have uh, a village of volunteers working for Food Link. Well, as volunteers, they don't get paid. And uh, through this, we work with local grocers such as Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Russo's, Bagelville, and we collect good nutritional food and redistribute it to organizations serving people in need. We collect over 1,100 boxes of this every month. And in, in December, we were up to close to 1,500 boxes. 80% of the food that we rescue goes to benefit low-income residents of the town of Arlington. Some of those organizations are the Arlington Boys and Girls Club, the Arlington Food Pantry, Arlington Eats, in addition to all of the low-income housing facilities here in Arlington operated by the Arlington Housing Authority. And these uh, places get at least two deliveries every week. And this is good quality nutritional food. Lots of fresh produce. The meats we get go to the Arlington Food Pantry for when the pantry is open. Currently, we're doing this, uh, as I said, with all volunteers. However, we're also using volunteers' van. In fact, one volunteer has given out about 10 keys to that particular van. So people can just go pick up her van to go pick up maybe 30 boxes of these uh, food from Trader Joe's in one morning. And um, so once, I, once again, I said about 80% goes to Arlington residents. You might wonder where the other 20% goes. We also work with organizations such as Medford Community Cover, Single Stop Program at Bunker Hill. We work with shelters in Lawrence, Lowell, Medford, and Malden, along with many other uh, organizations. So um, that's our program. The project that we're requesting funding is specifically for the low-income housing facilities here in Arlington and also for the uh, services. We provide some food for the participants in Minuteman Senior um, Services uh, Congregate Dining. One thing, working with the low-income housing facilities for the uh, elderly, it's more than just about the food. It empowers them to create their own mini pantry. They sort the food, they organize it. You see people working together of different cultures that wouldn't come together otherwise. So it's more than just about the food. Julie's going to talk a little bit about what we do with Minuteman Senior Services. So we'll receive um, from Trader Joe's and from Whole Foods not what most people consider just canned goods and non-perishables. So we get fresh salads in both small and large containers, freshly made sandwiches and wraps, um, as well as the meats and prepared foods that we put in the freezer. So these fresh items um, go to the senior center and as well as fresh produce. So they'll receive bananas, apples, oranges upstairs every day um, to take home, and then they'll receive some sandwich or salad or both, sometimes soup as well. Um, and often then these folks will have dinner that night, which many either don't cook or don't have the ability to, to get the food in the evening. And one of the most interesting things is when Margot hands out some of these foods or things people have never had before. You know, it could be a quinoa salad, it could be a sweet potato, whatever. Um, that are prepackaged, and then you know she she repackages them for them to take home. So they're 
very different from what a lot of people have had before, but they, she gets wonderful comments and everybody's willing to try everything and they're really grateful to have something to take home and have that night. And we also leave um, bread every day and often produce at the front lobby area of um, what's called Central School. And anybody can come in the door <coughs> and take home bread and bananas if it's there like today. Um, so that it helps a lot of people who may not come to any of the other services that are set up or live in one of the low-income housing units. So, so what would be using the funds for if we did receive the grant were to pay for operating costs for a van, uh, at least that portion that would be working with the low-income housing facilities. Also, we've worked a lot with Christine Bongiorno. We've talked about having a quality assurance person. Because our volunteers work independently, we want to ensure that they're maintaining the standards that need to. We're working with food, also to help with some administrative work as well. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Yes. May I ask a question? You certainly yes. may. So you already have a van, or you want this to buy a van? We, the, the grant would be to pay. We're, we're hoping to get a, receive a donated van. We're working on that right now. So what the, some of the funds would be to, is to pay for insurance, uh, fuel and maintenance, but not to purchase the van. The van we're using right now belongs to one of the volunteers. Okay, all right, all right. but all for within Arlington, correct? Yes. And it is, any of the money towards the van is only for an inside of Arlington. The, for this portion, we're only asking for, I think, about to cover 45% of the cost of the van. So we would be asking the other 55% for the cost of the van would be uh, received through donations uh, from various sources, or sometimes the organizations will give us a delivery fee. Right, but all within Arlington, that's all I'm yes. trying to clarify, use of the van. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay. Further okay. questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Great thank you. talk. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lisa Urban from Fidelity House in Arlington. I want to thank all of you guys, first of all, for supporting us over the years. This really is a program that we run at Fidelity House that is community. That's what I really feel like the Community Development Block Grants is. It's not just building a building, it's really developing the youth and the, the citizens of the community. And um, that's what makes it a community. So. You know, we ask for 18,000, and what we use, the, the program it costs much more than that. It's the Manami Manor Outreach Program. But what we do is we provide transportation. One of the things that we found is the biggest, obviously, financial considerations are a big hurdle for a lot of these children growing up that just may not have the same opportunities as other kids, um, but also transportation sometimes getting to a place and getting to a practice or getting to join in on an opportunity. So what we do is we offer um, bus transportation for six weeks during our summer day camp and then um, day camp scholarships. So the kids come a minimum of two weeks, usually it's three weeks um, per kid uh, to our day camp where they have swimming lessons in the morning, free swimming in the afternoon. Um, it really is a day camp experience. Uh, and then we provide transportation home. And then during the school year, we pick up twice a week. On Tuesdays, we pick up and they come to Fidelity House, they get free memberships, um, and then they can join in any of the programs that they feel th inclined to do. Uh, and then on Saturday mornings, um, we bring them and they join a basketball program and then use a facility in the morning um, and then also you know, once again, transportation there and back. Um, and I feel like I'm missing a big part of it. But uh, obviously, we're a year-round thing for them. And, you know, the more opportunities we can offer, uh, the kids are great, you know, and it's just a great opportunity. I mean, we've been doing it since the 1970s, and it's just it's a, one of the most rewarding things working at Fidelity House is, you know, is seeing kids having the same opportunities and you know, what they do with it in the future. So um, I'm hoping that you guys can help us out again. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions, but we appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Good evening. It's Pam Hallett with the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Uh, I want to, first of all, thank the selectmen for 
your many years of support in the past and the town as well. You've been very generous and great. And I hope this continues. I hope we all continue to have a great relationship. Uh, in the past year, we've gone ahead and bought um, three sites in Arlington. The 20 Westminster building, we did use uh, some of the CDBG money to help us purchase that. <coughs> We're now going through the 40B process to have the zoning change. We've started with our community meeting and we now have our application into um, the um, MHP, which is one of the state agencies that will help us get the eligibility. Um, we also purchased 1173 Mass Ave, which is the Kimball Farmer Historic House. <coughs> uh, we are getting close to starting our construction. We're waiting for final contractor numbers, and then we'll be going in for a permit, hopefully within the next three weeks. Uh, we should be through and renting up in uh, June or, uh, between June and August, excuse me. Uh, and then uh, we purchased the 117 Broadway as well, which uh, we're working with the uh, Arlington Food Pantry and Food Link and the Gleaners uh, to go ahead and for two years at least have the Food Pantry operating out of there as a second location. And then we hope to go ahead and do a mixed use project there with commercial on the first floor and somewhere between 24 and perhaps 30 units up above. But that again will have to go through a long process of changing the zoning, et cetera. So um, in addition to that, we have our homelessness prevention program where this past year we have supported 38 households in maintaining or moving into new permanent housing. Uh, we raised that money not through CDBG but through the generous people in Arlington and uh, we support them with up to $1,500 grants in order to keep them either moved or uh, security deposit, first month's rent or back rent in order to keep them in the unit they're in. So um, that's about it. Any questions? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Susan Stewart. I live on Alton Street in Arlington. I'm Lauren Ledger and I'm on Franklin Street. And we are co-chairs of the steering committee of an organization that's new in town called Arlington Eats, which stands for Eat All Through Summer. We are a group of volunteers that work to provide um, meals to Arlington students during school vacations. As you know, about over 500 students in Arlington qualify for free and reduced price lunches here in the school system, which is a really wonderful service for them. But through the years with shrinking safety nets and um, other resources feeling tight, um, these um, free lunches have become more than just a helpful convenience. They've really become a, necess a necessity to low-income families. Um, then when school vacation comes, there's no free lunches or breakfasts to go to, and that's where we have stepped in to fill the need. Um, we've only been in operation for just under a year. We figured this was a year to try out, see what we were capable of, where we could grow, what services we could provide. During the last year, um, Last year during February and April vacation, we um, did a pilot test down at Thompson School and fed, provided 270 mm -hmm. free student meals, all from donations, uh, mostly from the interfaith community for those vacations. Then we decided to start a small pilot program last summer working out of the Thompson School and it quickly grew to serving 200 lunches a week um, during eight weeks, well seven weeks of the summer and sending home grocery bags full of food thanks to our partners at Food Link, Food for Free, Arlington Food Pantry, and other community partners sending home 25 families um, food over the weekend. Um, we continued our work through the fall with weekend food bags, sending home um, food for up to 90 students and their families um, during the weekends, serving another about uh, 1,800 student meals during the fall for weekends. And I should mention over the summer, we served about um, almost 2,900 meals um, between the weekend food bags and the summer lunches at Thompson School. And we've also started a snack program at the schools where kids can come down to the office and um, check out and get a nutritious snack anytime they need it if they've come to school without snacks. And we provide 250 to 300 snacks per week at the Thompson School and several other schools that come by to pick it up. We are very grateful for our partners in the community with the Arlington Food Pantry, Arlington um, Food Link, and Food for Free from Cambridge. For that, we're able to stretch our resources that have all been through volunteer donations. We've been able to stretch them really far, providing a lot of food for very little money. And we hope to expand the program this summer even more. And Lauren's gonna tell you about our request. 
So we've requested six thousand um, dollars for the CDBG, which would go primarily to help us fund and grow the summer food program. We anticipate that that would that would take care of about two thirds of our budget for the summer. Uh, we hope to feed about eighty to a hundred kids per week this per summer. Day. At, per day, mm -hmm. sorry, at. Um, <laughs> 80 per kids per day at the Thompson School, where um, my kids are lucky enough to go to school and mm -hmm. where Susan's kids went to school as well. Uh, we have found that the reception for our organization has been really fantastic in the short amount of time that we've been here. That the families who use our service report that they are able to take away the choice between buying nutritious food for their children and paying their electricity bills. We find that teachers talk about how many fewer behavioral issues are going on this year. Um, kids are doing better in their classes because they are coming to school with food and they have food available to them at any point that they need it during the day. Our community partners, I hope, are happy that they have a great place to distribute the food. Food's not going into landfills, it's going to the needy families in Arlington um, who need this food. And we found that we've had about 200 volunteers step up to try to get involved with our program. So we hope we're meeting a need um, in Arlington of really getting in touch with your community, kind of the micro-volunteer ism that um, I think we all kind of crave. So we really want to thank you for hearing us today and um, considering us as the new kid on the block. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? Yep. So uh, thank you uh, for what you're doing. It's unbelievable. It's humbling, actually. All of the ones we've heard from tonight. Um, but it's only for the Thompson School, am I understanding? Or uh, if a kid comes from another school, anybody in Arlington is available? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. We, We've okay. been working through the years. If I send my kids down there, can they? <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. They're One 21 thing. and 18. <laughs> <laughs> well, first and I feed work, them 80 <laughs> to 100 meals about. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight. We. Um, it's always an interesting, uh, the CDBG hearing, to see all the good things that are going on in town. Um, things that maybe are under the radar and not everyone knows about, and this certainly uh, sheds a little light on to uh, all the great things and all the great people we have um, working to good causes. So thank you all very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may also, uh, of course. I was asked to speak on behalf of the Boys and Girls Club, which I do each year, but um, they, they use these for uh, underprivileged scholarships. And, uh, their request this year is for 20000 in uh, scholarships. Thank you very much. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Kiro. Oh, I, just, I just wanted to echo, echo and just thank everyone who came out. Um, you know, I, I did have the opportunity to attend the, the five-year uh, um, you know, forward-looking session, and um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about how you know, Arlington has become increasingly a more affluent community on average, incomes and... and um, and property levels, but you know the rising tide hasn't necessarily lifted all of the boats. And I think the applicants that come before us really represent a web of, of services and social services. And I think if, as we read the applications and as even as we listen to the presentations tonight, one thing that stands out is how many of these organizations and programs are actually working with one another mm -hmm. to complement the, the work of each other, and how um, it, we also heard from Ms. Wiener that, you know, we have a gap. I don't envy my colleagues who are on the subcommittee and going to help draw up the um, recommendations as an $800,000 gap, but I think behind every dollar that we uh, approve in, in this program, I, I think we're hearing there are a lot of um, community members who are stepping up with volunteer hours and, and with private fundraising and, and private funding sources, and um, I, I think Lisa put it, put it well when you said you know, community is what this is all about, and I think this really is the definition of community, kind of building that that web of, of cooperation and, and services. So I'll look forward to seeing what um, what you all bring back to us as recommendations, but uh, I, I don't envy you the task. <laughs> Thank you very much. You, you know, if we put together, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, we put together the number of hours that these volunteers put in, 
it would dwarf the million something that we get to give out. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it's that that's such a gift they, that so many of you have given to the town and to our youth. It's it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, moving on, uh, we're going to move on to appointments. Um, starting off with. So do we need a vote on that though? We, we took one beforehand. Oh, I thought that was for the previous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Moving on to appointments, um, the Arlington Cultural Council, uh, Jeff, who we saw earlier. Hey, Jeff. Uh, thanks for. Uh, Jeff, where have you been? We've been waiting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to skip any. <laughs> um, Please, if, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, how, your interest in the Culture Council. Sure. Um, just been living in Arlington with my wife, my daughter, for about three years. Um, really enjoy just looking to give back to the community, have a passion, interest in culture. ACC looked, seemed like a good fit, so I'm looking forward to starting there. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from the board? I, I just say th thank you for stepping up and volunteering. I, I think you know there's been a lot of activity around here. I do notice from your resume that you work for MEMA. So you yes. guys been a little busy the last couple of weeks? Yeah, a few. <laughs> <laughs> Sleeping at work. Yeah. 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 No, um, thank you very much. Um, you're, no, just no, thank good. you so much. I mean, what an excellent background, and uh, thanks for your willingness to serve. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Let's move approval. Um, second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Moving on, another appointment to the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, Seth Fetterspiel? Hey. Perfect, Seth. Hi. How are you? Thanks, um, thanks for volunteering for this. Could you please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, interest in PAC? I believe you've already been working with them as an associate member? Yep, exactly. I've been working as an associate member since uh, July, I believe. Um, I'm also relatively new to Arlington, lived here for about a year and a half in East Arlington, um, looking to get more involved in the community. I've um, always been particularly interested in transportation issues and particularly the sustainability aspect of those issues. I work for the State Department of Environmental Protection and so hoping to kind of unite my professional work with some volunteer work here um, as part of the team and I've already been working on some very interesting projects with them. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from the board? Motion from the board. I move, oh, sorry. Can I move approval? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. much. And thanks, thanks for your work. Um, I'd like to thank, um, of course, uh, both new volunteers. Um, as we always, uh, we've seen quite a trend of this of new individuals in town um, stepping up to volunteer after only a few years. And uh, that's very cool to see. So thank you very much. Um, moving on, we have a request for a common victual license. The North Ender Italian Kitchen at 1345 Mass Ave. <laughs> <laughs> Please come on up. <laughs> Hi, my name is Iyad Haddadin. I, I live in Acton, Mass, and I'm excited to open a restaurant in Mass Ave here. We have another restaurant in Concord, Mass, for almost 15 years, and I'm um, working in the food and beverage uh, service since 1989 so and I have everything will be like Italian uh, fresh food pizza pasta salads calzones everything will be like fresh awesome That's it. thank you very much uh, questions from the board Dan when are you opening uh, I'm <laughs> planning to open this week oh excellent I'm ready yeah uh, yeah yeah I've, I've been waiting for this meeting you know it canceled two times wow. so. mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> we figured out, by the way, that if you schedule a Slackman's meeting, it'll snow that day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then next Monday, I think. We're all really watching excited. next Monday. We exactly. Have, we have a meeting scheduled for Monday. Out. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I'm here today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second for the discussion. Kevin. Uh, thank you very much for choosing Arlington. Thank so you. you'll keep both restaurants open, do I understand? Yes. You'll, you'll work between yeah. the two. My, so. my, like my, me, my brother also. Okay. Yeah. And what role will this young gentleman be playing? <laughs> <laughs> He'll be the big boss over there. <laughs> <laughs> and I always ask, any samples tonight? Yeah. Yeah. No. 
and it's a lot to do. I'm still going to vote for you and I'll come in and buy your sample. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you for choosing Thank you. Arlington. Thank you very much. Thank you. Further, further discussion, seeing none. Discussion from the crowd. Seeing um, none, uh, thank you very much um, for coming here. And I live up the street, so I'll be stopping by. And ditto. Thank you. Yeah. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What was um, up the heights? Um, just I feel like that's mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Moving on, um, discussion and adoption of the Hackney policy insurance requirements. Um, so in um, in our packets, you will see um, some recommendations that. Um, bye. bye. <laughs> Um, some recommendations that uh, the office um, came up with in um, while working with an insurance expert, someone who's been in the industry for quite a while. Um, it will raise um, it will raise um, some of the insurance requirements for our taxis, and it will bring it on par with um, most other communities and. Um, that being said, um, you have the recommendations in front of you, and I would um, just like to open it up for discussion. Kevin. Move approval, and thank Marianne in particular for her hard work on this, as always. Thank you very much. Dan. Uh, have, for the purpose of discussion, uh, I'll second. Uh, um, have, we, have we sent a written notice to current insurance, uh, excuse me, to current license holders this proposal and if so, when did we do that? Yeah. Um, it was a point of discussion within the last six, eight months. I don't really know uh, the date of when we did have the discussion. Um, for this meeting, no, I had to talk with Stephen and we decided that, you know, let you all talk about it and then we could inform them during the next renewal process, which will take place hopefully within a couple of months um, okay. most meet the requirement I think that on um, I think it's uh, mr. Megan uh, specifically uh, the Boston ride who does not uh, and that was the one uh, company that has the bond with mm -hmm. the state for 10,000 mm -hmm. um, and you did hear from him he, he did come before you to speak so uh, he could, we could invite them all in if you want, but there has been discussion. We just kind of felt we'll take it to the next yeah. level and let you all discuss it. Did we ever actually like send them a notice saying this is the thing we're talking about doing? I, you know, I don't recall from the last meeting, but I'm pretty sure I didn't say th this is where okay. it's going. No. So I'm I'm inclined to support this, but I'm also fairly hesitant to like make a change without. Like you know, if if someone wants to come in and tell you tell us why it's a, a bad idea, I'd I'd r like to give them the opportunity. So I would be comfortable supporting a motion that something along the lines of, the board intends to adopt these procedures, we'll, uh, new policies. We will be adopting them at this particular meeting. Uh, you know, some, uh, but in they sending a chance for a response. And specifically, I really think we should give written notice to all current license holders. So a future agenda item. I'm, I going think, to, yeah. I'm going to believe and is what you want, and we'll currently just say that the current Hackney rules and orders are being looked at. To no, I, I the think insurance. we can even say like, uh, like I think send them this. I think we can. I, I think we can even send because I mean, provided the board comes to agreement, we can send them. It is our intent to, okay. like, and, and 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 I just I like being really clear with, like with. No, that, that's a good thought. Those changes. Okay. Um, I think that's reasonable. Okay. Okay. I, um, okay, Kevin. Are you so that's I dropped my motion. Let it right. let it be here. All right. So then, just to make it clear, um, I move that the board signal its intent to adopt these new insurance requirements at a meeting to be specified, you know, by the chair and the and we will and we invite anyone who wishes to comment, in particular the current license holders, if they wish to, at that future meeting. And we'll provide written notice. To yes, them. to them. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, Mariana, do we have a, um, a timeline that we're working under that we have to have this approved by? 
Uh, no, uh, we, we would like to push it forward. We have kind of hung back waiting to see what the state was going to do, and that's not panning out. So um, we just felt, let's move it forward. Um, and I had talked with Selectman Mahan, and unfortunately she could not make it tonight, but you know, I, I know that she's definitely a proponent for raising the insurance yeah. rates. But I will um, send it out, and I'm going to try to hit on probably not the next meeting, but we'll, the one we'll after that, we'll on one and we'll time. have them come back. And um, should I pr propose it to them that they, they have room for discussion on it, or just that this is our intent and we'll be voting that night? Um, perhaps this is our intent, and um, if we'd, we'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Okay, thoughts on it. Yeah. Okay. Um, discussion from the audience. Um, seeing none. Um, so that sounds like a plan. We have a motion on the table. We have a second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Four nothing vote. Thank you very much. Moving forward, uh, Citizens Open Forum. Um, uh, we are working under a new sign-in policy. So uh, if you are here for Citizens Open Forum, um, I would hope that you could uh, sign in on the sheet that we have outside. Perhaps not tonight, but at the next meeting you, uh, you attend. And so, except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it looks like um, there's Quite a few uh, names on this. I think many might have been here for um, CDBG. So if that is the case, um, I'll just skip over you when I read the name. Um, Pam Hallett, I believe, was here yeah, for CDBG. Um, Susan Stewart, CDBG as well. Lauren Lager, CDBG. Um, Chris, One Ridgefield Road, I believe that was for CDBG as well. He was the gentleman with the Sorry. operation yeah. success. Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Regan, CDBG. Okay. So we'll, we'll continue to work on this sign-in policy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Get it out there a little earlier yeah. next yes. meeting. Well, uh, yeah. Um, Alan I Lenore. Or how? Yeah, I, I saw the thing going around, and I was like, I was, I was like, uh-oh, this is not <laughs> what it was supposed to work. Um, Jeff Boudreau. I have nothing to do. I'm under uh, correspondence. Uh, gotcha. Thank you. Um, Deanne DuPont and Julie Cream both here for a uh, seat. So we'll uh, continue to work on that, but uh, thanks for your patience. Um, moving on, for approval, Transportation Advisory Committee, Lake Street Corridor Recommendations. Uh, Jeff and Howard. Good evening. Members of the board, thanks for having us. Good to see you. Nice to see you as well. Um, you received our report. I'm here to give you a summary of our report and answer questions. Um, first off, I just wanted to acknowledge the working group we had. Um, it, it's a complex project. We've been at it for a little while. Um, Howard Muse, uh, chair of the TAC. Um, let's see who else is here. Seth is back here. Um, Scott Smith, who's not here, who's also on ABAC. Um, uh, Wayne Chenard, town engineer, also on TAC. Uh, Ellen Law, um, resident, um, is also on the working group. I want to introduce, um, we had a cons uh, consultant on this project, uh, uh, Jason Sobel, professional traffic engineer. And uh, also in attendance, uh, Laura Wiener is on the TAC here. Uh, retired members, uh, Emeritus Ed Starr, and uh, Elizabeth Carr Jones, because they love transportation and are here tonight. So. <laughs> I thought they loved the selectmen meetings. They love those <laughs> too. <laughs> and Alan, because of Elizabeth, is that? <laughs> <laughs> so let me just go through uh, the methodology, some of the existing conditions, and get to uh, the alternatives and recommendations, and we can answer any of your questions. Um, we collected new traffic data and obtained historic data, uh, evaluated existing conditions in the year 2018 and the future and we constructed a traffic model to evaluate alternatives. Uh, there's approximately 1,300 two-way vehicles on Lake Street during the a.m. and p.m. peak hours, 
in the peak direction it's about 800 vehicles um, the peak volumes on the bikeway are about 250 in the morning peak hour this is a combination of pedestrians and bicycles and about 330 in the p.m. peak hour not so much tonight but during the warmer <laughs> warmer weather months uh, average vehicle speeds on Lake Street are about 28 to 30 miles an hour uh, it's posted as 30 miles an hour uh, we re reviewed crash data for three and a half years. We found 110 crashes along the Lake Street corridor. We did find four crashes of pedestrians or bicyclists at the, the bikeway crossing itself. Three of those are injury accidents. Um, there may be more that are unreported. We know there's a lot of near misses at that intersection. Um, this is no surprise to you. There's long vehicle queues and delays on Lake Street during the peak periods. Uh, conflicts and confusion between motorists and bikeway users. Uh, motorists slow or stop at the bikeway because of the unpredictability of uh, users crossing the bike path and the lack of uh, right of way. Uh, motorists often have to stop both at the bikeway and Brook Street when traveling down the corridor. Um, delay and queues on the Brooks Avenue approaches to Lake Street also, particularly during the morning peak periods. Uh, there's poor sight lines uh, looking from Lake Street onto the bikeway. And uh, motorists use residential roadways as cut through traffic um, to try to avoid some of that congestion on Lake Street. Um, so our goal was to improve uh, mobility uh, along Lake Street and also safety as a major, major goal of this project for all users, not just uh, bikeway users, but also motorists. Um, we developed and identified alternatives for this project. Um, we looked at uh, large scale alternatives from grade separation to widening of Lake Street those were rejected early on due to uh, significant impacts and costs of, the, of those alternatives. And we focused more on traffic control measures and identified a preferred alternative um, that results in the best combination of operational and safety benefits that we feel uh, for the project. So we developed a set of recommendations uh, based on our analysis. We tested um, uh, roughly eight, eight alternatives of differing uh, various uh, signal uh, control uh, along Lake Street. Our recommendation is to uh, install a new traffic signal at Lake Street and the bikeway intersection that includes separate signal beacons for traffic, pedestrian, and bicyclists. That signal will be coordinated uh, with the Brook Street intersection that's about 225 feet away and will be optimized. And that intersection would be coordinated and run, we'll get to some of the details, but coordinated during peak periods, but it could run and non-coordinated mode and off-peak periods, which that will mean there'll be less delay for bikeway users and off-peak periods. We recommend installing a left turn arrow at the northbound Brooks Avenue approach to Lake Street at the, right at the Hardy School. Uh, we like to widen the bike path in the immediate area of the intersection to improve sight lines, and widen that out for both bicyclists and pedestrians. Uh, trim and remove vegetation to improve uh, sight distance and sight lines at the intersection. And because there's a lot of details uh, which go into this, uh, we've, uh, we've been at it for some time in talking about these details. We're confident it can work, but there's a lot of uh, details on how the signal would work, how it would be interconnected, the timings, uh, different times of day, different times of week, how that would work, the detection and so forth. We're recommending a design review committee be formed to evaluate those details as we get in, if we get into the design of this project. They'll include um, TAC, DPW, Arlington Police Department, Walk Arlington, ABAC, members such as that. Uh, other, other members of the town can certainly be involved. We think it needs that kind of uh, oversight when we get to design. Uh, there's several benefits we've identified for these recommendations. It would reduce the queue on Lake Street, particularly eastbound in the afternoon peak hour um, by over half a mile. The queue would be reduced uh, because the additional signal reduced delay by six minutes throughout the entire quarter during that PM peak hour. The signal system will be programmable, as I mentioned. We could have different times uh, for diff different timings for different times of day and different operations. Um, it would improve safety by formalizing the crossing um, and identifying user right away and improving sight lines, um, which is a confusing intersection today. It will improve the operation for Brooks Avenue motorists and Lake Street. So there are some trade-offs with this. Not, uh, not everything's uh, potentially a benefit here. Uh, the vehicle queues would be more managing the queue on Lake Street. So that queue, we would manage that queue and it'll get to Mass Avenue faster than it does today. 
So there would be a slight, there would be an increase in the queue at Mass Avenue on Lake Street, but we would still see those benefits in travel time. The new signal um, would reduce delay on Lake Street, which uh, may encourage other traffic to use Lake Street. So if you improve the capacity or manage the operations of the corridor <coughs> better, you may induce traffic to use Lake Street. And some of that, because of that queue on Mass Avenue, uh, from the Mass Avenue intersection, um, may be encouraged to use um, uh, Brooks as a cut through. So to the degree that that would happen, we're not, not sure at this point. That's potential drawback of the, uh, the recommendation. In the preliminary cost estimate for the, uh, the signal program and recommendations that we're, we're uh, stating tonight are about, uh, preliminary estimates about $150,000. Uh, that would have to be fine tuned as to, again, the further, further details of the design. And that's, um, that's a brief overview of the, uh, the report that we submitted, so I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Howard. Um, Howard Muse, uh, Chairman of the TAC. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, this study was in, uh, initiated at the request of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, there were two requests sent to the Board. Uh, one was to look at traffic operations on Lake Street and to see what could be done to improve it. Um, and as we got into that study, I think we became more and more convinced that the operational problems were the bikeway and uh, Brooks Ave intersection. Then a few months later, another request came in asking us specifically to look at the bikeway crossing. So I just offer that as background why there is so much focus on the bikeway crossing. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, this is a, um, this report is, um, you know, quite detailed. Um, you know, there's a lot of evidence. You can tell quite a lot of um, work went into it, quite a lot of hours. And I, um, I'd just like to thank all the members of TAC for that. This is, um, and this is only one of, you know, several projects that the, um, TAC has going on. And I am incredibly grateful for their dedication to this. So thank you very much. Um, questions from, questions from the board. So, uh, um, uh, Jeff, again, and Howard and the whole group, thank you so much. Um, did, it, did I understand you correctly, and I haven't read thoroughly uh, all of the pages here, but that there, over three years, there are 110 accident reports? There's 100, 100 crash, 110 crashes have been reported along the entire quarter. Right. So that's from Route 2 up to Mass. But, and then did you say four of them? involved a bike or pedestrian of 110? Out of the Did 110, four that? were at the crossing. There were additional pedestrian um, crashes not, not at the crossing, or bike, a, cu a couple not at the crossing, but four at the bike crossing, most of which are injury. Okay. Including and, injuries. And, uh, okay, that's all for now, thank you. Thank you. Dan. I have a series of questions, so you should feel free to stop me if I go too long. Fair enough. Um, First off, uh, so, uh, thank you very, very much. But uh, So from, there's one in there that said, uh, comment, the new signal system will be consistent with the newly installed two signalized crossing in Lexington. And I'm assuming that's referring to Hartwell and Bedford that right. were mentioned later. Right. But um, I was confused a little bit by the newly installed because those have been there. A, did they change and I haven't seen Correct. it yet? Um, okay, yeah, tell the, me about that, that there's please. There's been the, the tra traditional signal was there, but they've installed uh, bicycle signals. Really? So you have the bicycle oh. silhouette, uh, red, yellow, um, green at those locations. So those have been recently installed oh, in addition to the, um, the pedestrian. Uh, pedestrian crossing. All right, I haven't seen those yet. So then is it anything, is it beyond the color and the shape being different? Is there like different actuation or cycling or anything like that? Or it's literally just like, hey, bicycles, look at you. This is a bike. It's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty, it, but it runs in combination with the, the pedestrian. So you can, uh, you can have a pedestrian countdown uh -huh. uh, with the seconds. The bike wouldn't do that. The bike would go green, yellow, um, red. But be, be timed to be coordinated. So it has like different modes? A different, just like a traffic signal. It would Interesting. Just, it's, it has the bike silhouette there. Okay, thank you. Um, another, a little bit later on in the report says, average pedestrian bicyclist delay at the bike path crossing increases from eight seconds for no build to 27 seconds under alternate one and 22 seconds under alternate three. I followed that and then I got confused by this sentence pedestrian bicyclist delay during the afternoon peak hour and non-peak periods will be lower. So when I was discussing the operation of the signal, 
To get those benefits in travel time for the motorists during the peak period, we have to coordinate the, the new signal with Brooks Avenue so those platoons can travel mm -hmm. through Lake Street. It doesn't have to operate that way in off-peak hours and probably shouldn't because we, we can have, afford to have more delay on, mm -hmm. on Lake Street for the vehicles. So in those cases, the signal can run in uh, isolated mode, mm -hmm. at which point if a bike or pedestrian was detected or pushed the button, they could have almost preemption, very little delay crossing. Okay. But why, do, why does that apply during afternoon peak? Uh, it should be off-peak. Off, off yeah, okay, so during the afternoon peak hour and non-peak, so that's where I think okay, that may so be. And, you know, off, it can, and that's something that the design review committee can, yeah. what, what exact times that would be. Mm -hmm. The peak period would be essentially two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. We can, we can tweak that exactly. But the rest of the time, we can run in you know, free, free operation mode, and, and the bikeway crossings will have very little delay. Okay, all right, two more. <laughs> um, so the left turn lane on that you're proposing on Brooks, so uh, uh, yeah, that's on Brooks. Uh, well, a left turns uh, arrow, not uh, lane per se. Oh, okay. So it would be like, it's, so in the other direction, it would be a delayed green kind of thing. It actually operates uh, like that today, except there's no arrow, so it's a, it's a little confusing for motorists. Okay. I thought you were trying to say put in a lane, and I was like, where the heck is that? You're gonna be? Okay, all right, now I understand, thank you. Um, last one's probably the trickiest. Got a lot, we, so we, uh, as I'm sure I know other board members did as well, we received a lot of feedback that was concern about, um, that I would talk, I would consider it mostly about the neighborhood impact, because of, you mentioned kind of unquantified things that might happen, like more people might use it, or, or, or things like that. Um, how, you know, given, given that concern and that feedback that uh, we're getting, like, how would you respond to that or how should I respond to that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a legitimate uh, question. So one was we'd, we'd have to monitor the situation, mm -hmm. you know, before and after to see if that, that is a case. I mean, on the other side, if you're improving capacity and traffic flow as well, we may reduce impacts or cut throws in some other places. So if that's the case, I mean, now we have right turn restrictions onto roadways uh, during peak hours, uh, p afternoon peak hours, such as Margaret and other side streets. So um, that those type of prohibitions or restrictions um, can be considered. Uh, timing of the signal at Mass Ave, uh, retiming it. We looked at it as it's planned as part of the Mass Ave project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we can look at adjusting timing, uh, optimizing those timings as we need to, if we need to have more green time on Lake Street or so forth. <coughs> and then you can consider, uh, you know, traffic calming measures um, as another, uh, you know, consideration, either to prohibit, discourage, or slow down uh, people if that, you know, if that is a concern. Okay. I will say that um, so my comment, I guess, is it's one of the, I'm not, I don't remember if you actually said this during your presentation or not, but I, I certainly read it, is that the potential benefits here is that we would have um, at the ugly times in the afternoon, 3,000 feet shorter queues, mm -hmm. and the wait time would be more than six minutes shorter for cars. Yeah, the, tra the, tra the travel time or delay would be shortened by up to six minutes. Which to me is like, that is such a big win that I'm it's very, very interested. It's, uh, it's significant. And um, also, yeah, I want to mention this, you know, the safety um, aspect of the intersection. And I know, you know, people have different views of the signal. Would it be safe or not? We feel it would formalize, um, you know, the right of way mm -hmm. um, who has, a, you know, a green light to cross, which is, you know, rather unclear now, which yeah. I think is part, part of the problem for not only safety, but for the, uh, you know, the, the vehicle progression. Yeah, I know that we've, that you've mentioned this, or I, I know that this has come up in conversation before, but as a bicyclist, I know that I will sometimes come to that and knowing full well what a terrible intersection it is for the cars, is that I'll just come to, a compl you know, I come to a complete, I, I mean, I'm not going to deny that there are times when I'm someone who will go sl slow to a safe thing and then go through that thing. But the time I said, I know the traffic's bad. I'm coming to a complete stop, and I'll be there on the stop line waiting and knowing that the light is green and the cars should be going, and the cars just sit there and stare at me. And I have no choice but to, like, you know, like, go across. And so there's no amount of, there are parts of this that there's no amount of enforcement or signage are going to stop because, you know, people just sometimes very politely stop for the bike, which in this case um, causes some of that. All right. I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Jill. 
Uh, thank you. I, I'll echo my colleagues and thank you, thanking you for the work. Um, I, I did notice in your recommendations you did suggest that um, potentially you might want to consider placing an officer um, at that crossing initially to observe conditions to emulate yeah. what, what the um, um, coordinated signal would be, would, uh, be like. Yeah. Um, is that something that you were considering be, because of the potential concern of, of an uptick in uh, traffic volume through that area? Yeah, it, and it's just, this is probably one of the most complex uh, uh, you know, evaluations we did, we've done on TAC, and we, we've done a few. Um, as, as we got into the details, we kept digging and digging. We've, you know, we've talked to DPW, we've talked to the town manager, we talked to Lexington, we talked to the professionals in the field. We did national and actually international research on, on this type of situation. It's fairly unique, the location of the bike path with the signal located um, uh, next to it. So one of the thoughts was that um, a police officer could control, can try to replicate how a signal may operate. Um, it wouldn't be that simple to do that. To, to, it's not just putting one officer and controlling traffic, because you're trying to replicate the coordination with Brooks Avenue signal. So it's it's not a simple thing. We, if if you know that's we decide to do that, we'd be willing to give it a shot. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not not entirely confident that the results may be uh, you know that we can replicate what a computerized system you know can do mm -hmm. um, you know along the corridor. So it is it is something to try to. Try to see how, would, you know, how would this work in, in reality. So it might be worth considering. Okay. And one one more question. If I understood correctly. The the off peak hours, um, the you'd be looking at that signal to be um, bicyclist actuated or pedestrian actuated, right. um, and then in sync with Brooks Ave. So w would it be mm. blinking otherwise to to alert uh, motorists to to the yeah. Uh, that's one of the details we'd have to discuss. There's, there's diff it could, could run, run out in isolation as its own intersection, just as a regu regu regular signal. Mm -hmm. The other way is it could run in flash mode. So mm -hmm. it could flash, um, you know, yellow on Lake Street, could flash, uh, you know, regular red uh, for the bike path. So that's another way. But in either case, the bike path users would get, um, you know, almost a preemption when they, when they are detected or push the button, they, mm -hmm. can, they can cross right away. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Kevin. You Sorry, one? Mr. Chairman. Yeah, as always, you should end it. Uh, I'd like to ask just one more question, the, and I'm, I bet you've already have looked at this, but the system that's on Mill Street, mm -hmm. which is a bicyclist pedestrian yeah. comes along and it blinks. Yeah. Did you look at that for this location as well? Yep. Yeah. So Mill Street, uh, of course, nothing in Arlington is like anywhere else. So. Mill Street is a different situation because there's the Mill Street and Summer Street are so close. Right. They're just a little bit over 100 feet um, separation. So uh, the, that's why we looked at the flashing uh, uh, beacon at that location because a full signal we'd have to run. If we did a f if full signal here, like we're considering Lake Street, we'd have to run Summer Street signal and the bike path as one signalized intersection. To do that, we'd have to have a lot of clear clear time to clear out the queues, and we, we'd really extend or increase the, the queuing on Summer Street and, and Mill Street itself. So considering Lake Street, we don't think that the flashing beacon, it's a little bit different. It would, it would be the sa same issues, we think, at Lake Street. Lake Street has a, a lot of crossings uh, for pedestrians and bicycles. It still wouldn't, um, it still wouldn't uh, define the right of way you know, at that location. P people, people slow down there now some people slow down anyway, so like there's nobody there. So we feel the flashing beacon really wouldn't add anything at that location. So we 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 ended up looking at a full signal for the benefits of uh, both traffic and and the bike path itself. So it was, it was a little different situation. We didn't feel the flashing beacon uh, achieved all of our goals at Lake Street. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Chef. I um, I bet we have a few comments from the audience, so I would. Um, I'd be happy to uh, take those now by a show of hands. Yes, seeing you first in the turtleneck. Uh, I'm Alan Linhoff. I just wanted to comment on a couple of things related to cut through traffic. I, I live on uh, Colonial Drive, which is one of the side streets between Route 2 and Brooks Ave. 
I heard from some of my neighbors through an email list we have that they feel like this change would be helpful with respect to reducing cut through traffic in that those neighborhoods where people are currently frustrated by the slow movement between Route 2 and Lake Street and then seek other ways around. Um, with respect to the potential for increased cut through traffic between Brooks and Mass Ave uh, due to increased flow, uh, one thing that's kind of peculiar about those crossings is it's quite seasonal during the, when the, during the season and the winter when the weather is bad, there's much less traffic on Lake Street. There's, uh, uh, excuse me, on the Minuteman Bikeway, faster flow down Lake Street. So in a sense, we're seeing today uh, uh, in this time of year, something that we may see a little more of in the warmer seasons later on. So the potential is already, at least to some degree, realized for any bad effects that may be happening uh, uh, with respect to cut through traffic in that uh, other section of the street. Thank you very much. Moving on, more comments. Chip. Uh, good evening. Sorry for the snow pants. It's still uh, quite cold outside. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Chad Gibson. I'm the uh, co-chair of East Arlington Livable Streets and also an, uh, uh, a resident of Barnum Street, which is in the neighborhood that Alan was just speaking about. Um, so um, this, uh, this discussion around the bike path light has you know, been around for a couple of weeks now, maybe actually probably a couple of months. We've talked with TAC a couple of times, and we've had many discussions amongst our group. And um, you know, we've, we've asked people for their opinions and, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, complications around this light. I mean, Jeff knows that as well as anybody. Uh, and, um, you know, that, 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 that is, uh, goes without saying, I mean, all these crossings along the Minuteman all the way up through Lexington, they're all different and they all work differently. And what we have at Lake Street is different than everywhere else. Uh, I've, I've, I've actually experienced that uh, intersection from a bicyclist perspective. I used to commute out to, to West for, uh, to, uh, to uh, Bedford, I've also commuted on, on the on the on the uh, as a bicyclist. And I've also commuted lots of times on, in car, and my wife still does that today. So we live this reality all the time. Um, and uh, you know, there's um, a lot of nuanced things that go on in this uh, in this intersection that I think need to be brought up, and they're hard to quantify. And what the TAC has done, and, and by no means is my um, a lot of my objection to this. Is, should not be con construed as an indicator of my, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, disrespect for their work because I, as as volunteers they do great work for this 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 town and they should be commended for that. Um, but that that notwithstanding, um, you know, I have some issues with some of the a the analysis that was done and then some of the I would consider negative externalities that are really not quantified and difficult to quantify uh, from the uh, from the analysis perspective. And TAC does note. Uh, in there that um, as we, I think, all intuitively know, Lake Street is, is clearly a, 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 a desired line uh, street when Route 16 is backed up, which is common practice. People are using that to go north-south through, uh, through Arlington, just like they do on Pleasant Street, just like they do on um, Park Avenue to a degree. You know, that's the flow that these, these roads are trying to, uh, uh, to, to manage. And as the backups at Route 16 are worse, the Lake Street traffic is, is, is uh, more desirable when the, when the queues are shorter. And, and, and the analysis, as they even said, you know, doesn't really look at induced traffic. And, and that's one of my concerns is that um, we will get some flow, but at the same time, water seeks its own level. And I'm, I'm afraid that not modeling what that induced traffic really could look like is a shortcoming because I think it's really, really dynamically coupled there that that road is so obvious that commuters will find that very quickly if there's a lot shorter length. So we could pump more cars through there, but we could then induce more cars at the same time. Um, so th that's one of my concerns is that's not being looked at. The other concern that comes out in the analysis is that the Q link gets longer at Lake Street. And um, I agree with Alan that if the flow is better on Lake Street, likely in the Kelwin Manor neighborhood, there would be less cut through traffic. Um, my guess is right now, I don't live in Kellen Manor, but taking a left turn off of Lake Street and then going through those circuitous, circuitous roads in Kellen Manor to then make another left turn onto Lake Street is not very desirable as is. So while people probably are doing that, my guess is it's not as high. My concern is that the bike path 
uh, Brooks Avenue intersection, which is really metering the traffic to Lake Street, I mean to Mass Ave, it, it, that's the bottleneck. And once you get through there, uh, there's no real reason or desire if you want to go uh, to go to Orvis Road or to Brooks Avenue, you can continue on to the Mass Ave Light because the queue is very, relatively short there. Um, but the analysis even shows that queue grows, and as that queue grows and the, and the, and the bottleneck is removed from uh, the, 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 the Brooks Light and the bike path intersection, I think the desire to come through the uh, neighborhoods of Brooks Ave and Chandler and Varnum Street and Thorndike, which do see cut through traffic now, I, can, I, I live there, I, I see it, um, you know, it'll be exacerbated. And um, that's a concern of mine. That's a concern because it runs by the Hardy School. It runs by Magnolia Park, which are right there. Both of those are, are very obvious cut through routes to come through that neighborhood. And, um, you know, if we want to do a more thorough analysis, we can, we can quantify that and we can also measure it. And, and, and I would like to see that the analysis, and I'm not sure how much it did, uh, looks at the measured data that's out there now. You know, we have a model, but is that model accurate to the, mo to the, the traffic conditions that are there now? So, so the, the concern of cut through traffic in after the bike path to me is a real one. And if this, this, this signal goes forward, I'm afraid it'll exacerbate that. And we need to do something uh, to, uh, to mitigate that. Uh, the other concern is the safety of that intersection. That intersection is the, and I'm, and I'm saying this in, a, in, the, in the proper way, is the slowest intersection along the bike path for pedestrians, cyclists, and, and, and commuters. And that is because of the ambiguity of the situation. We have a lot of foliage that comes right up to the bike path. We've got lots of walkers. It's the, probably the busiest intersection in town for pedestrians and bicyclists, maybe even in the greater Boston. You know, you have 500 to 1,000 people using that intersection a day. And you have the Hardy School. And you have commuters, and it's a busy road. And, and the, the light interchange there and the, the lack of, uh, you know, a clear indicator of, okay, now it's my turn to go, now it's your turn to go, creates this ambiguity that actually keeps everybody relatively safe because people are going slow. People, as Alan noted, and other people would, real, would know too, as you go down Lake Street in their car, they slow down looking for people on the bike path as just a habit. We should be happy that those types of things happen. Uh, that, that pat, there are some accidents that have happened there, but I would contend those accidents are minor because the speeds are slow. Uh, if we do go to a signalized intersection, what we will be telling people, A, on Lake Street and on the bike path is, A, it's now time for you to go. You can go at whatever speed you want to, and we're not thinking about those increased speeds in that intersection. And that will happen no matter what the queuing is, that will happen. And uh, people will not pay attention, and then they'll be hit with somebody by a car, by a bike, or by, I guess, a pedestrian running really fast, uh, you know, by, with this increased speed. And we've got these sidewalks that run along Lake Street at these perpendicular angles that are very hard to see. And so all that kind of increases the speed through the intersection. And I would say that's at the, uh, at the, uh, the reduction of the safety of the intersection. So I would, I would, and that's hard to quantify, but I think it's a reality that's happening out there. Um, so, so that is another, another point. And then, you know, we're, we're talking about $125,000, $150,000. You know, there are places that we could spend that to improve, you know, pedestrian safety in other areas. I think of Magnolia Park there. There is no speed table. There's no stop sign. That, that's a, that's a, a thoroughfare on Herbert Avenue for people to cut through. And there's children literally 10 feet from that intersection. A nice speed table there could really do something to improve pedestrian safety. Um, you know, that's, that's how, um, you know, I see it. And, 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 you know, irrespective of the... I've got a yellow flashing light or a red flashing light in my backyard for the neighbors, which I'm sure once they kind of hear about this, they're not going to be too thrilled about. And then also the downsides of the, um, you know, it can be mitigated with push button activation, but, you know, the facts are there's really nothing in this for people on the bike path, but at walkers and bicyclists, in my opinion. They're going to wait longer. Uh, off peak, they're going to wait longer. The street is so narrow, they're likely to run the light. I, I know in here the example was given that up in, up in a, up in Lexington, people tend not to run the light on, on 4225, and that's true because the, the car speed is very fast, so you're very, the risk reward is much different. You, know, you can get killed easily. It's pretty hard to get killed on Lake Street uh, because the speeds are slow. So, um, you know, I think those things need to be quantified. Uh, I, it raises concerns uh, for me as a resident of the neighborhood from cut through traffic, and it raises concerns from a parent that will be walking their kid to Hardy School. Granted, I don't go through that intersection, but I can understand why they'd be worried. Um, and it's not perfect, and I'm, 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 
you know, there's traffic everywhere at 515. And um, I think, honestly, what we should really consider, Jeff noted it, was, um, you know, $150,000 over, over a, a summer, because really it is a summer issue when people are out on the bike path, and we should be super happy that's happening. Uh, having a, 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 a cop mitigate that traffic. He can stop traffic. He can coordinate with that light that he can see right there, see what effect that has. We don't have, we don't have a, a, a capital cost that we're putting on. We are also not indicating to other motors that might use that road as a cut through that this is always going to be there. It's just a when it's sunny and it's summer and you know they, they can help move the traffic. The cop can mitigate the traffic. They can make that does not increase that does not decrease safety at the same time. And there's no cost after the cop leaves. It's back to where we are, which I think is pretty good. So $150,000 goes a long ways to something like that. I think a, a, a test of multiple months over the summer with some traffic counts and side streets to see if if there are is is a cut through traffic would make sense um you know we'd be happy to help with those counts um so uh, things like that i think should be looked at and uh thank you for your time and i'd like to thank the tac for their work on this as well thank you. Kevin. Kevin. chad what's a speed table speed table is like a speed hump but very long and large um okay. trying to think of the closest one here um Can i don't even know if there is <coughs> yeah yeah like in yeah, by the by the Fresh Pond, for example. Blanchard. Yeah, Blanchard Road, Fresh okay. Pond would be a good example. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, further discussion from the crowd. Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Carr Jones, a former member of the TAC. And um, I didn't work on this working group, but I do have some perspective on this particular project. Um, one thing I want to say is that the TAC would not make this recommendation lightly. I sat on the committee for 12 years, and nothing we worked on independently um, did we recommend a traffic signal would be put in. Um, and so this is not something that they do at the drop of a hat. Uh, another thing I wanted to say is that, along with Scott Smith, who couldn't be here tonight, I did conduct um, periodic uh, counts at this intersection on the bikeway. And the kind of behavior that I saw on both the part of um, motorists and uh, people using the bikeway was all over the map. Um, it was a big concern because what I would see was that certain people, like, as, as Dan mentioned, um, were very respectful as motorists of the bikeway. They knew it was there, they knew somebody could come out, and they were very wary. Other people went through that intersection as if there wasn't even a crosswalk. Um, and that combination, <coughs> and also the same sort of behavior, I hate to say it, uh, on the bikeway from both pedestrians and cyclists, very uh, uneven, you know, people, being very respectful and people being, you know, incredibly reckless in the way they ap approach the intersection. Um, I think what, what's happening here is we've reached a point, and this, this happens with many intersections in town, um, you know, I, <coughs> that there is so much use that a signal is warranted and that there's really no way to um, to deal with a situation that's this complex without a signal. And I think a signal might work very well because of the proximity to the other signal and the school. So it creates sort of a double, you know, a double zone. Um, there was one other thing I was gonna say. Uh, oh, it, a lot of the, I, I, I don't mean to dismiss at all um, some of the comments that have been made tonight about the potential for a traffic signal to, um, to have safety implications. However, I would, I would add that um, every signal that you put in to a complex intersection um, has those same concerns. In other words, some people will still go through a green light too fast. Um, you know, you, you can't stop that. But this is, the, this is the standardized solution to this type of problem. 
and I think that's why it's being recommended. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the discussion, Adam. Hi, I'm, I'm Adam Oster. I live uh, in on, uh, East Arlington on Cottage Ave. Uh, and I, I wanted to say how exceptionally forthcoming and helpful even by tax standards TAC has been on this issue and how patient they've been and to, to thank everybody. Um, um, I wanted to say to you that um, in spite of a potentially really powerful benefit, uh, especially in the evening commute, um, that I think there are some issues that, well, I hope you'll go s slow. Uh, it's not, I, from my point of view, it's, it's not a, a, a slam dunk. Uh, there are some issues that are sort of, their policy, they're beyond just a straight, you know, traffic analysis. Um, uh, there's a, uh, this issue entails some real trade-offs among users, um, b you know, b specifically between the evening commuters who stand to benefit and the path users, and there are um, uh, some potentially some issues about cut through traffic in the <coughs> neighborhoods, uh, which I think you've heard some of. I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I, I did have a question uh, about the TAC analysis. Um, it's my understanding that the numbers that were used for the model um, did not incorporate any assumptions about uh, what I've heard here tonight caused is an induced traffic or new traffic brought in because, wow, this is now such a great way to go. Is, is that right, basically? Um, no. Um, so when you did our counts in April, we found in talking about the afternoon peak hour going towards Mass Ave, it was a congested period. We only counted 600 vehicles. We know that's too low uh, as can process higher vehicles because that vehicles are queued and going very slowly, can't process that many. We have counted m more in the past, up to 800. So we, in our analysis, we increased that flow up to 800 vehicles in that direction. So that that would be more of a you know type of a maximum of free flow conditions. So that, in a sense, has some traffic inducement there. So more traffic, yes, you can add more traffic that wants to try to get to the corridor, but it's going to be hard to actually process that many vehicles through there. So, you know, 800, we could tweak it up <coughs> a little bit, maybe a little more, right. process a little more, but um, other than that, you know, the queues would just get longer. So we were attempting to you know, capture that latent demand by increasing the, the flow up to 800 vehicles. That's, that's not just um, cars that are already waiting and just can't make it through in that hour that you wouldn't. <coughs> bless that you. That's cars bless you. go that way at all, is what it's, you're saying. Uh, well, because I, I understand. I, I'm sorry, uh, gentlemen, but uh, all questions should be directed okay. through me, and mm -hmm. we'll go that. We don't need a discussion uh, at the microphone. We, we, we increase the flow from 600 vehicles to 800 vehicles for that, that, that hour to try to you know, capture the you know, maximum type flow. That's what we do. Thank you. Well, I want to push back um, sort of gently, tentatively, about the idea that this rep, this is a, there is a safety problem that this solves. Um, because it seems to me for an intersection of that, with that volume, that what we've heard about, you know, basically four crashes over three years. No, I believe it was a hundred. Well, that's for the whole, crashes. that's the entire yeah. corridor. And, but in and I, if I remember correctly, the four crashes was only with pedestrians. Not did that take into account cra car on car? Uh, I thought you yeah, said at the bike the path. Four, the four were at the bike path with ve vehicles and pedestrian or bike. Okay, thank and you. And there were other crashes along the corridor, but those are specifically at the crossing. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, I, I guess the hope is that, gee, if we put these signals up, and the signals are sort of the gold standard, that people will finally stop when we want them to stop, and they'll go when we want them to go, and that therefore there won't be any crashes. But if that's not true, and we're actually moving faster, then 
the consequences could be actually be worse. Um, I, I think it's more honest to, to, think, to represent this as, you know, there's a real benefit to commuters, to ve vehicular commuters, rather than to say, oh, we're solving a safety problem. Um, I get, I, I, uh, personally, I, I like the idea of a traffic detail there, of, of a traffic cop there. I know that on Route 16, um, when they have issues about traffic trying to get out of the WR Grace area and onto Route 16, that's how they do it. They don't put a traffic light there for something that's kind of seasonal and intermittent. Um, and, you know, I like, uh, I like built solutions. There are a lot of advantages to that. They sort of dispatch themselves impartially, but this built solution has other consequences uh, that if we can sort of get the benefit without getting those consequences, it would be better to do it another way. Thank you. Yes, please, come forward. Good evening, I'll be brief. I'm Catherine Farrell, I live on Park Street in East Arlington, and I walk every day right through that intersection. I'm also a driver. I'm not a commuter, but I'm a driver that uses Lake Street a lot. And I guess I'm echoing the slowdown because I feel safe there now. Um, I've never had a problem. I look before I go out there and I feel safe. I'm really worried about the induced, the uptick in traffic. So we're gonna have more cars. They may be going faster. And I think we have to consider that. So um, that's, that's a problem. That's why I think that maybe we should think a little, a little more about this before we go forward. Although I realize it's an incredible report that's been done, and it's an incredible study. Um, the other thing I'd like you to think about is there's a very similar situation in Cambridge. There's Cameron Avenue right next to Mass Ave. There's a stoplight on Mass Ave. And what they did is they made this great, they made a um, higher bike path. You can't miss it. So you're so safe on that. So I'd like you to con you know, consider that, consider the other things that were mentioned, and, and just take a second look at this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Further discussion from the crowd? One more, yes. Hi, my name is Connor McKenzie. I um, live on Elmhurst Road, which is about, um, it's a block over from Orvis, and you know, so I'm like two blocks from the Brooks and uh, Lake Street intersection. Pretty familiar with it um, from, you know, dropping kids off at daycare to, um, to work, et cetera. I've gone through there in a car. I'm a pretty regular bike commuter. Um, I used to do the um, heading out in the, mor the, 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 the morning madness when there's um, schools in session. Um, and I've, you know, I've dealt with that. That It's a very frustrating inter intersection. You've got the, you know, I'm coming out facing the school. You get the you know, people that presumably just drop people off at the school. They're coming out. They're playing chicken with you, trying to make a left turn. The poor um, crossing guards there writing down license plate numbers. <laughs> It's, you know, it's, it's a very frustrating um, situation. And I, you know, so I've sat there stuck in traffic and I'm like, ah, oh, come on, can I just get through this light? Thinking about it a lot, and I'm like, ah, oh, should they put a light there with Minuteman Bikeway? And I think it's appealing at first, but I, I just don't think it'll work. Um, or I don't think it would be improvement for, for safety, which would be my primary concern. Um, I think, um, you know, fundamentally it's a problem of volume um, that you have there. I think it, you know, the two ideas I've come up with are one of them practical and one less so would be a, a traffic cop or, you know, a flyover for the bike path. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, there's, there's been articles in the paper recently about how there's all this residential development going on right in the, in the Fresh Pond area, a thousand or so new units going up. It's a very, very congested area and, and probably only likely to get more so. Um, I think, you know, if the bike path intersection were the only problem only cause of the traffic problem then the pleasant street exit say coming off of you know route two at rush hour would be a breeze but if you get off at pleasant street it's you know backed way up too um you know it's just the whole area is congested at rush hour um so i think the the, the current situation which encourages you to go slow um because you've got the bike path you got the crossing <laughs> um marker there i think it's it's not bad i actually um, when the weather's nice, I actually um, bike my daughter to daycare on a bike trailer, and I go through that intersection, you know, the Mass Ave thing during 
uh, morning and afternoon rush hour, and I actually feel pretty safe doing that. I go there, I make you know eye contact with the first car, eye contact with the second car, and I go. Um, whereas I'd be more concerned about you know speeding with the lights. Um, you know when you you get people you know they get a yellow light, they might try to speed to get through and that type of thing. Um, and then the last thing I'd point out is that um, kind of a detail, but I think for putting a, a crossing signal and a bike path in a situation like that. For the cyclists, I think it puts you in a little bit of like a, a legal gray area because pedestrians have the right of way with a crossing signal, whereas uh, bikes are considered vehicles. So it's, you know, where do they fit in there? Do they have, the, you know, something to be considered in that situation. But all in all, I think, um, you know, I, I, I prefer the current setup and I don't think a light's a good, a good solution. Thank you very much. Oof. Further discussion. I'm seeing none. Um, further discussion from the board, Mr. Greeley. So, um, I'd like to, I wonder um, whether or not what we should do at this point is, I mean, I agree with uh, not necessarily slowing down. It's uh, the work of TAC as always is so thorough. But I wonder would there be a benefit to let's form that design committee uh, in term, uh, am I right? That wouldn't cost any money at this point to form a design committee, right, uh, Jeff? No, we're, we're we're talking about people who are already on uh, committees and town staff, so there would be no uh, no financial uh, funding. For uh, and you know, we've heard from a lot of people here tonight, neighbors, etc. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure the makeup of that design committee. But we want as many of the groups that have spoken here tonight certainly to be represented. But through the manager, I, I definitely would like to try the police officer down there. Um, uh, you know, I, I think two or three times also then as part of this design committee as well. Um, uh, and I know you had said you weren't, uh, maybe didn't think that would work so well, but I, you know, I, I think there must be a way uh, for us and, and then let the results of that be part of this design committee but in terms of before we would make a final decision. Uh, you know the counts on the taking the rights uh, that's another issue we've been, I mean it's amazing to sit here and how many people have come to us complaining about how long they're sitting on Lake Street yeah. and the result of this we're saying is no now it's going to be too quick and more cars are going to come on Lake Street. God, I avoid Lake Street at 5 o'clock at night uh, if I have to go out Route 2 and up and down Park Ave and up over the hill that way to Mystic Street. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I, um, I, I can't make up my mind right at this point in time, but I, I would absolutely hesitate not to take a TAC uh, recommendation. So uh, I, I think I'd like to move that we form the design committee and ask through Adam, um, through the through the police, that we have three times uh, a police officer uh, uh, working on the bike path in conjunction with the red light at Brooks um, to stop traffic and to stop people on the bike path, and let's see what happens there. Uh, unless there's not, yeah. I am. But I'll help sec. me in a minute, Jeff, with who should be on that design committee. Uh, I, I let um, my colleague speak first, but I'm just saying, think about that for a minute, if you would. You're going to second. I'll second it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chairman. I'm vehemently against that idea. Um, I, I don't think that a police officer um, or with well forming a asking a design committee um, first to do, you know, an awful lot of work that TAC already, you know, has really devoted a lot of time to, um, and then to ask them to, you know, embark on this journey where we might then say no. Um, after, so I think that could be a lot of man hours from a lot of people who volunteer quite a bit of time already, um, and it might be all for nothing at the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding was that the design committee would, you know, look at something that we're really going to implement, and then you know devote quite a bit of time to actually making this implementation work. Um, so I, I don't think forming, you know, studying this issue any further um, will really benefit us. Um, and that being said, I, I don't, you know, I, I appreciate that a, quite a few people um, offered uh, a police detail as a suggestion, but my understanding was that, I mean, it's pretty, I 
think it's pretty unrealistic to do the actual timing um, at Brooks and at the bike path with a detail officer. So I, I don't think that that will really get the results that we're looking for to you know further study um, this this um, recommendation. So um, I, I'm not going to be joining you in supporting that motion. Thank you, though. Dan. Um, I think I have a question for uh, so. I have a question for Adam, but I'll, I'll get there in a second, I guess. So, uh, I share Steve's fear about wasting volunteer time when we're not read, like we should. I would rather give a, try to figure out a way for us to give a more clear signal about what we're thinking about. That said, I am interested in what changes would happen if we tried an officer there, and I'm not even mean like three times. I was actually, I'm actually even just thinking like, like what if we did it for June and July, you know, something like that, because the, and something like that. But um, I guess my question for Adam is, so let's say tonight we voted yes. Let's say we said, you know, we're accepting this TAC recommendation and we think that there, we should put that signal in there. We obviously don't have the $150,000 budgeted anywhere. Um, how would you go forward if we said yes right now? What would you see as the steps and how would it play out? So I, I think if, the, if it was just yes, it would be form a design review committee, figure yeah. out who's on it. Uh, and then the other half of that, uh, from my perspective, would be figuring out how and when yeah. we could pay for it. Uh, so I'd sit with Mike Rademacher, we'd look at available Chapter 90 resources, other already allocated roadway resources, and see if there's something within existing budgets that we could use um, at some date certain to support this project, or if it would need an independent capital request, maybe an FY17 because we're already too far down the pipeline mm -hmm. for FY16, which would probably make sense based on where we are, timing-wise anyways. Um, and I, I think if I'm understanding tax uh, recommendations right, even if a design committee, uh, or design review committee was formed, that wouldn't preempt the possibility of still having some details issued to even help with the work, I would assume, of the design review committee. Mm -hmm. um, that said, going a little bit off your question, uh, I, I would feel like you know, just taking a step of having a detail would be a little bit of a feel-good move as opposed to a actually producing results unless it was really closely aligned with an end goal uh, of implementing such a change. That, that's my feeling. And, and I'd also feel before we have the board commit to something, I I'd like to have an opportunity to sit with the chief and someone from the traffic division to actually see how practical it would be um, from their professional opinion to actually implement, you know, something like what tax has been talking about. I have to admit, uh, my, my thinking was along the lines with, with uh, Kevin, Mr. Greeley, on, on this, but um, I, I want to probe this a little bit more because my recollection, it, it ha it's not unusual that this board will, um, you know, endorse moving forward with a process, but then review the designs and approve the designs when, when they come back to the board. <coughs> it seems to me that happened at Arlington Center with the, uh, the, um, the, 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 um, I forget the formal name for the project, the safe, safe travel project in, in Arlington Center that the, the uh, final design came back to the board for approval at, at, um, at that time. So it doesn't feel to me like Mr. Greeley's motion is inconsistent with what we've, we've done um, in the past, but uh, you can enlighten me. Yeah. No, I, it may, may yeah, I, please. I, I think that's a fair point, but I think in, at least in those prior circumstances you're referencing, using that term design sort of presumes that there is a built thing that's going to happen. Yeah. And that the design of it might be tweaked, but that something's going to be implemented. I think there's still a prior question here of whether or not something built is the direction the board wants to take or not. See, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with uh, moving forward with the, a, a goal of having something built, but, but forming this committee to come back to us with, with whatever that, that uh, sp the specifics around that solution. But I think that what Kevin's motion, if I heard it correctly, didn't include was an endorsement of a light. Yeah. And I think for a design committee, it makes sense. For us to say, please, this design committee, like, go do it, we should be serious that we want that to happen. Yes, Mr. Greer. Yeah, well, first of all, you're wrong, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm uh, no, I mean, it shows you the kind of issues we deal with all the time. I, I want to kill myself right now. I mean, I, I can't decide what the hell I want to do. I just want to clarify what I'm recommending, which is the, the police detail I, I view as a test of a stoplight there. 
So the light on Brooks Ave turns red, the police officer then moves out and stops the traffic in, in, at the same time, or approximately the same time, I understand, uh, and stops the pedestrians and bikes while it's a green light. Uh, so I'm viewing that as a test of a light, not a let's permanently put a police officer there uh, as a solution. So I'm, I'm viewing it as part of the, so would this work? And, and I understand the police officer trying to replicate the red light on Brooks Ave isn't exactly a one-on-one -on -one test of it. And my thinking on the design is I'm, I'm not quite clear to me about what really is gonna happen here and so, I mean, I don't want to ask volunteers to do any more than they normally do, but uh, TAC is looking for something to do. Let's face it, they're begging for more work. <laughs> uh, but, you know, but for them to come back and say, okay, uh, here is what, the, what it would be. Uh, you know, uh, here, here's what the design of it would be, and I, I don't want to make them do that work and then in the end say no. I'm leaning towards wanting to support this, but I don't feel I'm ready to do that myself. But I endorse investigating it further without people hating me. <laughs> yes, Mr. Chaplain. So, uh, uh, Mr. Greeley uh, raises a point that I had in my mind earlier. This, this is a huge issue. This is, since I've been in Arlington, people have complained about traffic and probably long before I was here. So this is clearly a large issue. And, tax been working on it for years yeah. now. So I don't think the board should feel compelled to make a final decision tonight. And that, I think, goes in line with what some of the folks who spoke tonight says is slow down, take some consideration. So I'd be interested in hearing, you know, what further information can I help facilitate maybe from town departments, work with tech a little bit to help get to that decision. And maybe, maybe part of it is talking more with the police about how we could, uh, you know, implement that traffic detail. Um, Maybe a, a more detailed process about funding. You know, you know some different pieces that are concerning all of you, and then maybe at the next meeting or following meeting, we could uh, have more comfort. Um, so I guess we'll ask what in, more further information the board would like from Adam at this point. Well, what's the solution? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I so I, I think I get I get where I b get. I think you, you, you two are, are on it, which is, and I'm in a similar place, which is I think this is probably the right idea, but there is definitely some hesitancy. But so things that um, resonated with me with the, from this, from the, but tonight what other people have said is that uh, I think that improving the traffic flow on Lake Street and reducing those queue times and reducing the time that people wait is a really big thing. I think that is, a, yes, it is for commuters, but I think it's really important. It's for the commuters, it's for the people who live in those neighborhoods. I, I, m things that will make that traffic flow better, I'm, I think we really, I, I really like, want to do something about that. Um, I'm uh, a little bit, I, I understand the concern about um, more cut through traffic and how it's going to change things and what the and like what would be the negative side effects. I suspect that what it comes out to is that there would be some negative things, but the question is, does, in this case, does the positive outweigh the negative? And I'm betting it will, like based on, and that's what TAC is betting as well, which is why and I you know I trust them and I trust their report. Um, I'm some people have there was a lot of talk about safety on, uh, here, and I. I agree that it is a, I mean, it, the, it is a relatively safe thing. I also don't think, I'm not as concerned about the safety of the light. I agree it's gonna change the nature of what goes on there. So I guess the, uh, maybe a way of asking is how can we speculate more or like how can we inform ourselves better about what the net is? So if we understand more about, like we, we've got like some pretty good computations about what the improvements are, but we've got less data about what the negatives might be. Joe. First of all, I think, uh, although our thinking is on the same wavelength, I was actually looking at the, the, the police officer in a different light, not as to whether or not to go forward, but as informing the, the design work itself and, and how exactly that, that would work. So I, I'm inclined to support the, the um, the recommendation, but with the strong, you know, request that 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 manual 
uh, monitoring be done. That having been said, I think when the manager asked what, what we could use, I'd, I'd like to see a concrete proposal about what type of support we could give to, to that monitoring effort, how, how long of, of a period of time, because obviously it is the summer time where, where the conflicts are, are the greatest um, between the, um, the trail and there. I did want to make one other note here, though, and I think we've all alluded to it. Um, in the tax report, it's, it's really specifically spelled out that, that it's not just a safety issue that's being a, a addressed. Uh, there are five issues that were actually, uh, the TAC was actually asked to look at, the congestion on, on Lake Street, the conge congestion on, um, and delay in queuing on Brooks Ave northbound, uh, safety issues were in there, but also the visibility and lighting issues, as well as um, the traffic congestion uh, causing uh, cut through. So there are actually five specific issues that were asked the TAC was asked to look at here, and I think you've done a, a really good job of, of taking those on. So um, I think we have a new, I think we're on the same wavelength, Mr. Greeley, with, 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 um, with what we're asking, but I think maybe there's a nuance into, as to why um, we're asking, or maybe we've converged. Uh, so to Adams, uh, you, uh, you, you already said you will talk with the police about, uh, however that works out, the detail, the, but, in, you know, uh, uh, for visibility or whatever the case may be, how tough would it be for us to get traffic counts on, like, Colonial Drive and Margaret and those side streets? How difficult? Do we have a machine that does that? I, I know a lot of times I see TAC members out counting cars. Do we actually have one of those counters that cars drive over? I believe we either have one or have access to one. Is that right? Uh, APD has a traffic count one, right? You know, I know that we do have one, Elizabeth. Yeah, we have two. We have two. And, uh, it, but I know that's going to take a while to gather, but that's something I'd like to know. Uh, and, and at least if we had the pre data and we do make this change, we then can do a post on it as well and see whether there's. We're, we're never going to be done with this neighborhood. We're never going to be done with any major neighborhood in Arlington, let's face it, with traffic, with volume. And East Arlington is so exciting and, and growing uh, in such a desirable part of town, we have to be very uh, very careful what we do there. Uh, and, and the people who want to move in there are, are pedestrians and bicyclists who want to walk around and the rest are commuting through, or well, many, myself, many are commuters, I understand, and we have to make room for all of them. But in terms of what, what Adam is asking, uh, I'd like to, to know whether or not a police officer uh, could be out there for whatever period of time along with what uh, uh, the, the chairman and uh, uh, Mr. Curo and Mr. Dunn also want and uh, could we get could we get traffic counts on the side streets yep I'll say thank you sir Dan uh, Joe was I interrupting you or did no. you okay no. so um I, one of the th questions that's in my head and I think that it would behoove all, each of us to ask ourselves is if we are going to say yes on this, it's no matter what. If there's a leap of faith involved, right? We're saying, you know, we're we're and we're saying we're accepting the recommendation of experts over, yes. the, and there's unknowns in that. Yes, agreed. And so the question is, what is it that we each need to convince ourselves, either yay or nay? Mm -hmm. And that's a tricky one. I agree. Um, I'll say I um I fully support tax um, recommendations. I think that this board set out. Um, several times and asked them to solve a problem and they came back with the problem solved. Um, you know, I, I definitely understand uh, some of the concerns that raised today. Um, you know, I think that removing the ambiguity from that intersection makes it safer. You know, I, I understand that there are, there are concerns about speeds, but I, in at least I feel that with the lights, you know, everyone has a time to go and you know, whether you're crossing, um, you know, on foot, on bike, or in car. Um, and I think that we should, you know, at least at the outset, I assume that people will obey those laws. And I think that that will make the intersection safer. And um, I think that this does come down to congestion, quite a, for me, quite a lot of it. And it is a absolute nightmare there. And this will help that. And, um, I, and I'm, I'm uncomfortable with asking for, um, you know, further work to be done on this after so much has already went into it. Um, so that's why I'm, um, 
I'm going to stick by tax recommendations. So there you go. I think uh, there is a motion on the table. Um, if there is further discussion. Refresh my memory with the actual what Yeah, we're refresh mine. I made it. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I would maybe think the board would contemplate a motion to table pending response with further information. Is that is that reasonable given the? That is the motion that I meant. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> with all with all due respect to TAC and all due respect to uh, the chairman, but uh, this is big. This is not uh, a couple more weeks, a couple more meetings, whatever it takes. Uh, okay, I'm, so we I'm have willing a, to uh, wait. We have a motion and a second. Second. Aye. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Moving forward. Uh, Mr. Chairman, sorry. I want to say that uh, it is a pleasure to have this debate with such respectful uh, opinions being given on both sides. I agree. I agree. Even though some are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, some are wrong. I'm sorry. Um, but, but, but just clarity, we're not going ahead with any design committee or anything, right? Yeah. We're, we're just saying we're delaying we're this. We've all yeah. requested further information. That's yeah. All. Okay. Yes. Moving right. forward, warrant article request. Um, busy night for Ms. Wiener. Yes, please. <coughs> this could be a What's potential here? funding source for this project. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, there's always that. There's a lot of Thank buzzing you. behind me. I didn't hear you. So um, I'm here to tell you about a new state program that was passed by the legislature last summer called Complete Streets. Um, it's a program. I'm, I'm sorry, Laura. If uh, everyone in back could take their conversations outside, please. Um, it's a program that is under the supervision of MassDOT, uh, the Department of Transportation, and um, it will, it's intended to have about $10 million per year for street construction and design for streets that qualify as complete streets, which is basically a street that accommodates all users, pedestrians, bicyclists, drivers, transit, and freight, which in our case is trucks. <laughs> um, the, the Mass Ave Rebuild project is an example of a complete streets project. The goal of the program is to decrease congestion and improve the environment and encourage what's being called healthy transportation options. In other words, trying to get people to get out of their cars whenever possible. Um, in order to qualify for the funding, there's a number of criteria, one of which is that the legislation has to be adopted by town meeting. A lot of the details of the program are not finished yet, but because of the timeline of getting something to town meeting this year and wanting to be ready um, next year when the, the money is available, um, I have been working on a warrant article with um, the town council that uh, I, would, I guess I would like you to submit. Um, and all this warrant article does is accept the legislation. It does not bind you in any way to any policy changes or um, really anything else. Um, MassDOT is drafting guidelines right now, so we will have some proposals for a, a policy in the coming weeks or months. Um, there's a working group of TAC that's chaired by Scott Smith that's already started working on it, looking at what some other towns have done for their policies, um, and we'll be coming back here with the details. So what I'm saying is there's nothing binding about this except we're just accepting the program and getting ready to be in a position to um, apply for funds. Thank you very much, Laura. Yes, Kevin. So uh, a couple of questions. I, under I, I, I recommend we, um, we, uh, that we recommend favorable action on this. So uh, a couple of questions. Um, uh, who decides what streets are going to be, would receive this funding? Um, once the town gets certified, then the town will apply. Um, I don't know if they'll have like a, a deadline, a competitive deadline, or if it'll be first come, first serve, but um, I'm sure the Department of Public Works and um, Adam will make those decisions, and, and you as well. Yeah, that's the one I was looking for, you as well. <laughs> she started there, actually. Have, that's absolutely. Right. Good ending. Yeah, Adam, Thanks, sorry. Uh, more, more than likely, the complete streets policy that would be discussed uh, and then presumably enacted by the board at some point down the road would, would contemplate all right so we're you know we're doing you know x amount of road work you know which kind of roads or streets qualify and then if they do qualify then i think we'd actually be saying in the policy we have to make it a complete street so it, 
would basically be if this is a road that falls under the categories as we set it, we got to do it. Right. To, to get the funding. So may I one more second? Yes, certainly. May. So uh, let's let's say we finish the East Arlington project and move up through the center and and hope to get state and federal funding again. What impact does this have on that, or it's just another possible source of funding? I, I would feel as though this puts us in a better position, Com you know, compared to the past, to get state and federal, and also maybe additional funding through this program. Okay, all right, thank you. And that one will be well on its way by by the time we do the, the next iteration. Thank you, Joe. Will this potentially uh, fund a bicycle crossing signal on Lake Street? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know for sure, but a pedestrian bicycle crossing. Yeah. A pedestrian <laughs> bicycle car. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, but, but no, would uh, the whole street have to. Yeah, like have street. To qualify, not just a crossing on the street. We just I, I, really don't I, know. I, yeah, yet. we're waiting for yeah. more guidance. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. Yes. Further questions? No. Seeing none. Further discussion from the crowd. Yes, Adam. I'm, I'm very pleased the town's uh, being so quick on the uptake on this. This reminds me a little of the Green Communities program where um, we qualified for extra funding by being so early. Um, I just have one question and it's about the proposed warrant article because I know from some previous conversations that we weren't clear if this required, in addition to a town meeting action, adopting the law, a bylaw amendment that would include the standards in order to qualify. Mm. And I guess, it, do, we kn do we know that? Be because if we don't, then the article should be reworded to include the possibility of a bylaw. Thanks. Doug. Sure, so this uh, article is more or less as suggested um, by uh, the folks who have been developing this program over time. One of the nice things about Complete Streets is it affords some flexibility in terms of how much uh, local government, how local government wants to decide how it's going to implement its complete streets sort of regulations, if you will. Do they want to do it by town bylaw or do they want to have it be a little bit more flexible than that? It's a choice that we get to make, uh, but the first step that we have to basically engage in is in accepting the legislation and then if it happens that the Arlington wants to have a set of bylaws to outline how it's going to go about its complete streets, it can do that. Or it can do it by, you know, basically a policy that this body could could adopt and accept, uh, and formulate itself. Thank you. Can I of course. Um, because the guidelines aren't out yet, it is possible that we would want to change the warrant language before town meeting. But we, I mean, we're trying to get something in now so that it'll be in, and then um, as we get, they're saying March, they'll have guidelines out in March, so. Things may change. Can, yes. Can I, on that same point, I, I just want to remind everybody, the warrant is just for the purpose of advising people of what we're going to potentially be voting on. If there are things within this article, if there, if there are things that we don't necessarily know right now that come up later, the point is, is that we're considering adopting this legislation and we would have time by the time we would go about to town meeting to have motions to amend any motion this board comes up with or anybody else. Thank you. Dan. So to me that says that Adam's, I, under, I understand Adam's question is saying uh, if we, w so we might in March be asked by the state to amend our bylaws and this warrant article as written wouldn't permit us to do that. Uh, that so, that's not my understanding oh, oh, of, of, of. Which of, part? <laughs> so while they may, come out with guidelines for us. Yeah. My understanding is that at this point, they're fairly clear that we could do this by a bylaw or we could do it by a less um, formal process or at least a more, a, a more readily changed process than doing it by bylaws. The point is that we have to have some kind of regulations in place when the money becomes available to say yep. this is how we're conducting our complete streets. And I do not, it's not my understanding that they're going to come out with a new guideline that says, no, 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 you don't have that flexibility. Adam. Uh, just to say it in a different way, um, 
the, 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 the law reads bylaw or administrative policy. Got it. So they'd have to change the law before issuing the guidelines, in my opinion, yes. for us to not be able to have an administrative Thank you. policy. Thank you very much. Further discussion? Seeing none, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Moving on, Mr. Greeley, discussion and adoption, Selectman's Handbook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that this board uh, approve the uh, alcohol licenses and regulations, which overall is just a compiling of that which already exists, but a compiling an organization other than, and Steve, if you get here first, or Doug, if you could tell me the, the, um, uh, the, the two areas, uh, one is related to allowing sidewalk uh, service of alcohol, uh, and uh, can anybody t remind me of where we are, what, what that section is? The, the second thing is, on the club's licenses, uh, what, what uh, we feel would be best is there's not, the only changes there is we did include the penalties uh, as in other sections, uh, but that we meet with the club managers uh, at some point, probably after town meeting, and kind of discuss a lot of those blue laws that are in there and, you know, uh, just kind of get the clubs uh, on the same page with us in terms of the rules and regulations. Doug, is that, and Mr. Chair, is that a re accurate reflection, do you think, of what we discussed? So, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Chairman? Yeah. Uh, Mr. 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 Greeley, I, I think there's a, there might be a problem with the, uh, what's on the Novus agenda, mm -hmm. because if the board will recall, you came, we, we submitted basically this, Condent we already submitted this uh, condensed version of all the various different policies that the board had passed over time, along with some that um, were sort of new additions. And this board submitted uh, requests for revisions to be made uh, by myself and the selectman's office. Right. We made each one of those revisions um, by reviewing the our notes and the uh, by watching the ACMI recording of what had occurred last time, and I'm. Looking at this now, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I'm not sure that the changes that the selectmen requested are all reflected in here, but that was the purpose of coming back to the board with this, that we basically yeah, right. made we a series of changes mm -hmm. to uh, policies. We did not pursue certain changes that would be more comprehensive with respect to club licenses because we haven't had an opportunity to uh, fully vet all of those changes, but we made some that, for example, which comes to mind, Mr. Kiro, highlighted a practical change, which is that there were certain um, non-discrimination provisions in there. Not that non-discrimination provisions aren't important, but that the current state of the law wouldn't require us to state with the specificity that we were at that point in time, that you're not allowed to discriminate against somebody. So uh, that was the purpose of coming back today with the revised policy based on all of the suggestions and edits that you guys had basically provided the last time this board convened. That you're, that's your understanding. Of it board, is, right? yes, yeah. yeah. I think maybe just. Is there something that you are particularly concerned that's missing? Because I went to a couple of my hots. I did not read every word again, but I went to a couple of my hotspots that I had been concerned about, and I read them, and I liked the change. So I, f I feel the same way. As I, I didn't actually check to make sure that you know each change was there. It may be that the track changes that I'm seeing on here are the, were the original track changes from the document. Mm. There's a been right because most of the tr so for instance under if you open up if you're in the PDF view um, it's page seven where the first words on the page top of page seven say D, D physical plant mm -hmm. but if you actually go down from there under E three consumption of alcoholic beverages on the on the premises like we that language is clearly updated to what we talked about. Yeah, in my view, I have comments from Ms. Margolis, who was helping us yes. compile the original. I did see a few of those, and I just figured yeah. that I didn't, but I didn't. As long as the changes are on I, I honestly like didn't sweat them. From yeah. the yeah. Joe. I just noticed one change that didn't seem to make it in. Um, it looks like there, there was work done to, to bring all the various sections um, into conformity with one another as far as what the, the uh, table of potential penalties was. 
however, on um, uh, private clubs, while we do have the uh, first, second, and third offenses spelled out, we, we didn't include the provision about the um, uh, the penalty being imposed on the same day that, that the violation occurred, which which we have done for other establishments. And I, I think that we had agreed to, to, to that um, for the last time, so. We can certainly make that, we can certainly have this be approved subject to that change, although I, I don't recall whether, and I apologize, I don't recall whether or not the change I would note that from a policy standpoint, there might be a slight distinction between what the, what the clubs would, the hurt that the clubs would feel by having the penalties enforced on the same day versus the restaurants. I, I don't recall um, that motion. I don't, I just, I guess I don't recall the discussion fully at the time. Yeah. But, um, the, the, I know the intent I no when I when, I when I put that out there, the intent was that we we handle all of these establishments yeah. um, in in a uniform manner. There's no problem to make it uniform. If you wanted to move to approve this subject to that specific change, we can insert that, Mr. Kira. It's okay with me. Okay. Just, would you like that, Jeff? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so that would be included in the motion. Um, further discussion on this. Looks good to me. We have a um, motion from Kevin. Do we have a second? Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, so, uh, I, yes. if I may, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. So, uh, two things. One, next is parking, but it, that's going to take a while. So, mm -hmm. just, it, 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 we won't see a Monday night with parking. Uh, although I know we've taken a first shot at it and we're gonna meet again, but uh, you can't emphasize enough how much Marianne, Doug, Eve, and uh, Steve are helping on this as well, so thank you for that. But I would like to make a motion, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to draw your attention to page seven, where uh, really Mr. Dunn just had us a moment to go. And if you read, this is at the bottom of E3, and at the very bottom, all right, uh, all outdoor food and alcohol service shall conclude before 10 p.m. Thursday through Sunday and 11 p.m. Friday and Saturday unless otherwise affixed on a particular license as approved by the board. Mm -hmm. So I would like to now make the motion that we affix the license of the Monotomy Grill to uh, allow their service uh, on their uh, Balcony, what am I calling it? Their outdoor. Terrace. Uh, their terrace, thank you. Because they're unique in that they're, they are the only ones that we licensed to have outdoor service because you have to enter the restaurant and exit through the restaurant in order to be there. So what we've done with the sidewalk, and now saying by 10 on uh, you know Sunday through Thursday, whatever those rules are, uh, uh, so I, I just feel, you know, they, they followed our original guidelines and therefore we should have fixed their license that they are allowed to serve on the terrace. They may be very interested in doing some sidewalk tables as well, but those would have to conform to the 10 o'clock and the 11 o'clock rules. But so Mr. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm saying that right. But well, Mr. Really, the, the only, uh, if, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. I think. Um, what this is essentially is, is doing would be amending a previously issued license, correct? So we would be amending the license of the Monotomy Grill and Tavern as it currently exists. Well, I, I don't, you tell me, uh, yeah. because right now we've now changed the rules to you have to stop serving outdoors by 10 o'clock on Sunday through Thursday and 11 o'clock on Friday and Saturday. So that now, that's outdoors, that covers them. So I'm saying I want to allow them to have the license. You're saying that their hold. current license allows them to serve past that point in time now. That's right. So what I would, what I think what we should do instead of, uh, what I respectfully suggest to the board is instead yeah. of raising a new issue at this meeting is, uh, as much as I don't want to delay this any further, um, because that's an issue for a specific license and applicant, um, that we should either uh, have this um, delay the implementation date of this specific 
um, of, of the adoption of this policy so that we can put on the agenda for the next possible meeting that we want to amend the license for a specific license holder. Because otherwise, because they have so much outdoor dining right now. <laughs> so well, what I'm trying to say is, is that there's two possibilities. Either one, we can table this particular issue and put it on an agenda for a future item, for a future meeting, or we can just delay the implementation of this and take it up simultaneously. Because I understand what you're saying is that we are in effect men amending their license as it is right now. Um, but I don't think we should do it without have there being an advanced notice of that issue on an agenda. Does that make sense? Yes, except when I asked you this question, you told me this is what to do. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Greeley. I, I, this was a mistake on my part, and I take a, a, I'll take responsibility for that. No, 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 I'm not worried about that. I just don't know why I can't do what I want to do right now. I mean, we have just adopted, you have to stop serving outdoors at 10 and 11. We've just adopted that. Sure. So that automatically changes their license, doesn't it? Well, it changes it changes the, the, the rules for basically all licensees. Right. And what we'd be doing now is amending a one specific license holder's license without having noticed that issue prior to this meeting. So again, I, I accept responsibility for the uh, for, for not making that clear but we're amending the general policy for all license holders. And I understand that as a practical matter. We have done that, we've just voted that, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I think that this specific request, this specific motion should be tabled until we can take it up at a future meeting so that it can be noticed. A hearing on it and everything? I don't think it requires a hearing necessarily, uh, Mr. Greeley, but I do think it's important for us to uh, have it be noticed that this specific type of action is being contemplated by the board. Um, what do my colleagues think? I, I just think all I want to do is keep the status quo. Well, it, I have a question. <laughs> yes. I have a question for council. I, I think this raises an important question. By, by changing these policies, are we automatically changing current licenses or do they come into effect when they renew? No, we just changed them. So. Well, no one has outdoor other than Monotony Grove. Yeah, no, 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 I get it. In I get terms it. Of service of alcohol. No, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Marianne? So, go ahead. I get it. I'm just going to ask you out loud instead of just talking to Doug. Um, currently, alcohol licenses state the times on them. So, does that protect them through this? Like, if they wanted to make the motion question. and do yeah. it in their license states on it. Does that protect them until or not? So what I'm trying to say is that we're changing the policy to basically set out the outer limits of when everybody can basically operate. And for the most part, with respect to this one specific situation, I think we've actually expanded the hours that everybody can operate, um, just not this one very specific situation with respect to Monotomy Grill. So uh, the uh, board is basically adopting a policy to say, no, that the hours are restricted from that. Um, and you basically can't have a license that's operating outside and contrary to the board's to the board's policy. So, uh, I suppose the, the 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 best possible compromise that I can come up with is if we can, and I apologize for this, if we can uh, basically revote to basically say that um, adopt this policy uh, subject to uh, allowing um, current licenses to maintain their. Um, current hours of operation uh, and the, the, I'm sorry, that we would adopt a policy um, but uh, allow current license holders to keep current operations until they apply for renewal or otherwise apply for a change to their license is I think the most um, right. neatest way that you can do it. All right, let's do this. Uh, so let's just adopt this policy and then I'd like this on another agenda. That's what, because we're in the middle of winter. Nobody's opening outdoor restaurants. Monotony Grill isn't serving outdoors. Right. So if town council says this is how to do it, let's just leave that, uh, because nobody complies with this right now. Uh, right. 
you know, and, and but it would change Monotomy's license if they were serving people this Friday night outside. They'd have to, right. you know, they couldn't mm -hmm. coincide with their current license. So, okay. So, so we'll get that on another agenda right. moving forward, and um, we I think that finishes the yeah, discussion of. Okay. Thank you. That. Uh, moving on, correspondence received. Um, we have a request to rename the Summer Street Field. Um, the, we got a letter regarding Summer Street Field improvements, and we have a request for the town to modify existing website standard. Um, I, I, if, uh, if you don't mind, I'd recommend sending the first one to the Public Memorial Committee, and uh, the second to the uh, Parks and Rec Department. Um, Joe Conley is already on this, and um, I've spoken with and I know that by speaking to our town manager about this, and um, I will say, um, with the respect to renaming um, the field after Jim Roblard, he I've said before he was my coach for you know quite a long time, and I, I do find it fitting. Um, so, and I do think um, whatever improvements to the field are practical um, would be put to good use. And I'd like to thank the um, Summer Street Baseball Field Committee for um, all their work on this. They put quite a lot in. Um, they're willing to pony up, um, you know, their own money and their own efforts, which is always um, very cool on, on their part. So, um, so, so moved. Thank you. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And uh, our third one for a request to modify the existing uh, website standard. Jeff is here. Would you like to? Poor Jeff is still here after all of this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Jeff Boudreau, 99 Bow Street. I was not aware that there was a standard. I assumed there might be one, but uh, when I see it written here, uh, there must be a website standard. Uh, I went to the website looking for some information. It's generally very good, but uh, the roadblock that I hit was I was trying to contact a particular committee. It listed all the members with no contact information. If you clicked on the go to, it goes to a page and says they're on the so-and-so committee. So I've had further discussion with Mr. Chapdelaine and uh, he assures me that some work is being done and um, a, a master table will be created of all the people's uh, contact information. Uh, it comes to an issue of uh, privacy because many people are volunteers, they may not wish to list a uh, telephone number or an email address. We had the discussion, um, I believe that I might have had it with you or might have been with someone else. A, uh, each committee is assigned a generic at Arlington uh, address which would go to that committee, it would be used for official business. So at least it would be a point of contact via email if not uh, additional ways. I'm satisfied that uh, there's progress being made in this area. Another area that could be uh, improved would be terms. When the website was ported over about a, a year or so ago, the term expiration dates fell off. It seems that they're starting to come back with a year only. I would recommend that <coughs> a year and a uh, month, if not the full term, like if you go to the full page, expiration dates those be populated. And the uh, third thing in it was not really website, it's more of a human factors issue. Um, I serve on the uh, Cultural Commission. I was putting together term expiration dates of all of our members, and I came across a couple of interesting items, like there's a person listed with the town clerk as serving, whose term is expiring in April, who apparently resigned. The communication did not go the letter of resignation apparently did not go from the selectman's office onto the clerk or from the committee to the town clerk to the webmaster. So some higher degree of uh, coordination needs to be uh, monitored and put into place. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thanks. I, um, Thanks for your patience, Jeff. Yes, of course. And I, you know, I appreciate that. Maybe certain things might fall through the cracks once in a while, but I know um, all our volunteers are doing the best work that they possibly can, and they're dedicating quite a lot of time, so I'm grateful for that as well. Um, move for a seat. Uh, we have second. Motion and second. All those in favor, please aye. say aye. Aye. Thank you. New business. Marion. No. Thank you. Doug. None. Adam. 
very quickly, as the board knows, but I uh, want to make sure everybody in the public knows, we are very fortunate uh, just this week to learn that we were actually retaining the surface, uh, services of Chief Fred Ryan as Chief of Police. He's not leaving the community. Uh, he cited as one of his top reasons the uh, great joy he takes in working with his board of selectmen. So he's uh, <laughs> very, very, very happy to stay. I, I think it's, it's great news for the community. Um, uh, and also just to sort of bookend uh, how the chairman started the meeting, uh, I really want to thank all, uh, the whole team at DPW uh, and the community for their patience. Uh, I, the, the guys down at DPW have been working around the clock uh, trying to clean up the town. Uh, I, I think they've done a great job considering the circumstances. Uh, and residents, I think, predominantly have been very patient also given the circumstances. So I, I plead for continued patience, uh, especially with what's to come most likely in the next five days. Uh, but I, I definitely tip my cap to DPW. Thanks very much, Adam. Kevin. Nothing, sir. Dan. Uh, Joe. I, I just have one item. Um, I want to report, um, as you know, um, Mr. Mr. Byrne and then myself have served as liaisons to the Master Plan Advisory Committee, and last night the uh, Redevelopment Board did adopt the uh, Master Plan. They, oh, great. They, um, they did. Um, under the law, um, the, the Redevelopment Board really is the only authority that, that can ad adopt this and send it on uh, for, uh, approve it and send it on to the state. However, there has been a um, uh, kind of a commitment made to uh, the, the community that this will be presented at town meeting as well for um, town meetings uh, endorsement. So the redevelopment board last night, they did vote to um, place an article on the warrant, um, which reflected some language that the council had, had uh, uh, provided. Um, it's anticipated that they will be uh, going the route of a um, warrant article uh, resolution that just outlines kind of what what action has been taken and what we can see towards the future, because this is really just a beginning, it's not an end. There, there are over 85 implementation steps in the plan. <coughs> I think the board, the redevelopment board will be asking, uh, as sometimes does happen, will be asking this board to also um, issue a, um, a recommended uh, vote, even though they'll be the reporting uh, body uh, on this. So I just wanted to apprise the, um, the this, this this board of of that, um, I would guess that we're the the reporting body that that they would probably go first with their hearing, and then we would take a look at at their language. But obviously, that's to the discretion of the other members. Thank you very much. Um, I have one new uh, piece, of new business that I um, just came about uh, prior to the meeting, and it has to do with our um, traffic off one of our uh, traffic officers, uh, Corey Rateau, who. Um, you see his recommendations um, come in front of us quite often. And um, he was recently um, given an award by AAA, and that award is the Traffic Safety Hero of the Year, um, which is um, very cool, and it's a, a real testament to his work. I, you see him you know, in town hall in the police department um, really busting his tail every day, and um, that's, that's not an easy job that he has. Um, as we all know, traffic is... Um, a, a very tough issue to deal with in town, and he does a uh, really spectacular job on that. I also um, can find out that he really spearheaded, um, you know, a few grants that the town received uh, to secure uh, bicycle and safety enforcement grants um, for the past uh, three years, I believe. And uh, I'd just like to thank him for all of his work. And um, that being said, I have no new other new business, so perhaps we'll conclude Move the meeting. Move to adjourn. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you.